Can I get a roll call, please? Ty. Here. Tim. Here. John. Christy. Here. Mark. Here. Margo. Here. Frank. Here. The public hearing is to consider the proposed transfer of the homeschool assistant funds from categorical funding to flex funding, which can be utilized for any general fund expenditure pending board action to spend. The board secretary will read any written comments. I have none. Or if anybody from the public would like to come up to the microphone, you may so do so. Or... Yes, please state your name. Yep, my name is Matt Guba. Come to the um... microphone, please. Thank you. Okay, should I just get into it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, well, thank you all. I, brevity is not a strength of mine, so you may see me. I know it's rude to check my phone, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I also have some notes prepared. My wife um, couldn't be here. She's with the kids, so I want to make sure that I hit on a couple of things that she mentioned as well. Um, just to give you a bit of background from us, we moved to Fairfield from Boston the third week of February in 2020. So we literally moved out here, and two weeks later it was COVID, and we were kicked out of the office and whole lives shuffled up and down. So we, you know, moved out here at the time our twins uh, were five and we had every intention they'd move into public school. Uh, but COVID threw a little bit of a wrench in that. And so when we found out what homeschool assistance was, um, we decided to give it a try and we worked with Becky, who's been fantastic. Um, and so um, our thought was, well, we'll do that for a year, weather COVID, and then get them back into the public school system. Um, and then ultimately what happened is they were they were tongue tied and speech delayed. Um, so they had surgery last year, but what we were told is, you know, there's a likelihood that they would be held back. Teachers would have a difficult time understanding them and with 30 kids in the room, it's a challenge. And um, so for us, it was kind of like, okay, well, that's not acceptable. They're not behind in any other way. We need to keep going with this program. Um, and so, you know, at this point, speech delays fixed, they're all set, but you know, every other way they're up to speed, their testing and everything is, is right on track. Um, our six year old now, uh, Vincent started in homeschool assistance now two years ago then, I guess. Um, and he's a little bit of, of a different scenario he has Dwayne syndrome. I'm sure no one in the room knows what it is. It's super rare. But basically what it means is he has no horizontal eye movement and he has no peripheral vision. Um, so technically, like he'll never be able to drive in all likelihood. There's no cure or anything that can be done for all intents and purposes. He's disabled. Um, that said, he is exceptionally smart. Um, I'll never forget when they were younger, we'd read them stories out of those like books um, with, you know, 50 stories for five minutes before bed. Um, and often as we're reading through, I'd pause and ask questions. I know didn't expect a lot, but at least try and reinforce and start the whole reading comprehension. Um, and I'll never forget one time, he's, we, after a pause, he just started reading and picked up. And his memory, we always knew, was very good, so I just figured he'd memorized it, which is impressive, but right in line with what we thought. But when we got to the next story, he just continued reading, and we'd never read it, and he was three. And he's the type of kid where he hears something, and he gets it, and it's just, it's unbelievable. But socially, he's not all there. And we see it at soccer all the time. He's incredibly disruptive. If he's waiting in line or if, you know, something he gets that others don't, like he would not be the joy to have in class per se. Um, and so my fear is that you'd get this disruptive child who's disabled and not necessarily a fit within a large classroom and he wouldn't necessarily get the um, attention they deserve. So I, I realize that's kind of a long rambly story more than you probably need about my family, but the point is homeschool assistance works ex exceptionally for us. Our goal still at the end of the day is to get the kids into public schools at some point, whenever the time is right. Um, but for the time being, it affords them the best opportunity to succeed. Um, and so, you know, it was a little disheartening to get an email from a third party that this hearing was happening today, a week ago, with no mention of it, having been in the program for three years, it's not like we've had our heads in the sand. Um, but I do want to commend, you know, Frank and Steph, they, they worked, Steph sent an email on Sunday uh, with a lot of budget figures that I had asked for, and it was, it was super helpful. So thank you, um, you know, for, for the assistance in that regard. But what this all comes back to in, in terms of the vote at hand and why it concerns me is where the system is today. So 
for three years, we've spent thousands of dollars a year of our own money supplementing what we need for our kids because we're told there aren't resources to provide that. We're sharing books. We're in a waiting line for books to borrow from other families that have been used and worked on. So our kids are getting those. Um, the, the writing textbook that we have now is from the 60s. The resource library is mostly from the 80s. That's 40 years ago. Um, you know, we look at um, science. So we asked about science resources to get our, our twins, our eight-year-olds, and we were told there's no budget for it, there's no resources, plus they're only eight, they don't really need it yet anyway. Like, that shouldn't be acceptable. So I realized it's a ton of money, but we've been in this program for three years asking for resources and money and told no. So I don't see how we can repurpose money when the whole program kind of needs an overhaul, or at the very least, take a look at it and figure out what needs to be changed to get the people that are in it. The government's providing this money for these families, and I get, like, if it's not all needed, awesome. Spend it elsewhere, elsewhere and distribute it as needed. I, I understand this program doesn't operate in isolation, but you have to at least give the homeschool student, assistance students, excuse me, the resources they need. So with that, I could go on for a while. As I said, brevity is not a strength of mine, um, but I can answer any questions or I'll sit down. I don't know what protocol is, so. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anybody else? Come on up, Laurel. So uh, my name is Laurel Hilger. I'm on here in behalf of Karen Denenberg. I'm here to read a letter from her. Um, I worked in the homeschool assistance program for 10 years from 2013 to 2023. The program had always operated as if it didn't have any money. We scavenged materials, including textbooks, from those being discarded by other teachers. The same was true of classroom furniture, bulletin boards, and art materials. Each year, we would order consumables, such as spelling and math workbooks, office supplies, some art supplies, spending around $800 per year. The eight computers we had for students were the oldest models in the school and quite slow. We applied for and received STEM step-up grants from the state to get more up-to-date technology, such as Bebots and Finch robots. At least three times, I requested meetings with the comptroller to determine what our budget was and was always told to just send in requisitions and they would either be approved or denied. This made it very hard for us to prioritize what we needed for the high school assistance program or the homeschool assistance program. We couldn't plan ahead for a large expense such as new science textbooks for K through 12 or new computers because we didn't know how much money we had. The HSAP receives 30% of the full-time student state allotment per enrolled student each year. This amount covers the salaries and benefits for the staff, including teachers and part-time administrative assistant, and covers our other costs, including field trips, equipment, and more. We take no money from the FCSD budget. In the 2016-17 school year, our enrollment dipped and my job was reduced to half-time. We were told that we could not afford to keep me as a full-time staff. However, we later discovered that there were ample funds in the HSAP silo to cover a full-time salary. When the full-time teacher, student Chipman, retired, Susan Chipman, retired at the end of that school year, she was not replaced and I ran the program for a year and a half by myself. I had around 55 students, which was much more than the 40 allowed by law. We applied for and received a waiver from the state to allow this, as we had nearly every year that I had worked for the program. Becky Hollingsworth was hired part-time in 2019. She increased her time to 0.8 for the 2020-21 school year because the state, help, the state denied our waiver and insisted that we had more staff. In 2020, Becky and I requested more help, and in tw January 2021, we were able to hire Kim Olson as an administrative assistant in charge of the lending library, the monthly calendar, reminders for home visits, communicating with families of dual enrolled students when there were unexpected schedule changes in the district, and helping with the weekly classes that we taught. We were told along the way that we couldn't afford to hire more staff when this current silo balance clearly indicates otherwise. During the 10 years I worked in the HSAP, the program has moved four times. 
This is a huge endeavor, moving books and materials for grades K through 12 in every subject, including art, music, PE, and library. A permanent home for the HSAP is a top priority. We have heard from staff members, not teachers, that we are not really welcome at FMS and that people resent the amount of space that we take up. Also, when other departments need space, the administration has asked us to share hours. It makes sense that people see our rooms empty of students much of the time and wonder why we get the space. However, we need two rooms any time we have a class or activity, one for teaching and one for families with younger or older siblings to wait for the class to be over. Our lending library is stocked with math manipulatives, alternative curricula for learning to read, homeschooling books, games, and other hands-on materials that our families can borrow for a rich learning environment at home. Right now, the program needs to update most of the high school level textbooks, get a new elementary and middle school science and social studies <coughs> curriculum, get a new elementary reading curriculum, and update the computers. Other HSAPs in Iowa, including Mount Pleasant, hire specials teachers, PE, art, and music, to teach group classes. Fairfield cannot currently offer winter PE because there is not an indoor facility we can use for free. I would hope that, before the board decides to take the money that the HSAP has earned over the years through enrollment and yet never been made aware of, that there would be a dialogue among stakeholders to discuss how the money should be apportioned. Homeschooling families and staff should be involved in these decisions as well as representatives of the district. Let the program update its materials, fund more educational opportunities such as field trips, college visits, programs from the Raptor Center, Eulenspingel Pup Puppet Theater, or other traveling education groups, and hire a replacement for the teacher who just resigned. Then let's see how the district could also benefit for the years of popularity of the HSAP. Sincerely, Carlin, Karen Denim. That's really Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carissa Hickenbottom. I'm also a homeschool parent from HCAP. I have been in the program for five years now. I did not intend to homeschool my children, um, but I have a neurodivergent child and we, it was recommended by their pediatrician. And um, so we're still at it. Every year we discuss public school, but every year my kids still want to continue homeschooling or having a great time. I'm going to be reading a letter from a, um, another parent in the homeschool group. My name is Sarah Sanders, and I am the mother of Josephine Kaplan. Josephine is enrolled in the district's dual enrollment program. She is homeschooled in the mornings with me and then attends Washington Elementary first grade for the afternoon. Josephine's parent-teacher conference happens to fall at the same time as this hearing, so I am not able to attend. Please accept this letter in lieu of my physical presence. We have been really happy with the homeschool program and are pleased that it has proven to be an absolute right choice for my daughter and our family to enroll her in this program. The teachers in the homeschool program are fantastic. They get to know our kids and their academic needs. They provide meaningful small group activities, plan fun and informational field trips, and create a safe space to build community amongst parents both parents and the students. This program has provided for us an atmosphere and academic rigor that we want for our child. Now we learn that the school district wants to take necessary funds away from this program, which is both frustrating and disheartening. The homeschool program provides an invaluable service to its students. To cripple it in this way would be a huge disservice to everyone involved. As parents in this program, we are truly invested in our children's education. We are stakeholders, we are educators, we are involved, and we would appreciate open communication about such issues that directly concern us and our children. We have received zero communication about this, and we hereby ask that no decision be made at this hearing concerning these funds until more stakeholders have received effective communication. We would like the opportunity to discuss ways to improve, stabilize, support, and build the H HSAP program. The HSAP staff and educators do a great job and we really care about our kids. We would like the funding for this program to reflect the great work that they do. Thank you, Sarah Sanders, Eric Kaplan, and Josephine Kaplan of Fairfield. And I would also like to add, echo from my point, 
I always thought we didn't have, I would ask about things and I was told the same thing. We don't have money, these are the books we have. My children have been doing science and social studies books from the late 90s for the last five years. And I, I find that unacceptable. How many times I have to read a book and go, whoa, whoa, I even know that's not right anymore. You know, I shouldn't have to be doing that. And this is my fifth year in the program and the first time I've had teacher manuals because they don't have enough for all of us. And boy, is this year so much better for us having that every parent. We should be funding that fully. So thank you. Sorry, I can't see with my glasses on anymore. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bonnie Hilger. I have been a homeschooled parent in the district for 13 years. I have created my own curriculum for 20 years, collaborating with numerous organizations to successfully provide the best education for my children. Because the district doesn't always meet the educational needs of my kids, I recognize the many benefits of homeschooling. It is flexible with year-long learning and breaks whenever needed. It is continuous, pandemics nor weather stop it. It doesn't restrict curriculum by age or grade, and its curriculum is not limited to state testing requirements, allowing a more diverse course of study. Homeschooling, when done correctly, is the ultimate personalized education plan. The homeschool assistance program is not offered in every state or district. It is a strength that Fairfield has. I joined this program to access its library of materials, to have my kids instructed by its educators, and much more. Its instructors sit down with me monthly asking if I need any materials or guidance. It offers a collaborative team learning approach. I'm also a community and regional planner. I've always been willing to assist the district where needed. Ten years ago, I led the initial planning and writing of the Fairfield's teacher leadership and compensation plan. And most recently, I volunteered to serve on the district's revamped Strategic Improvement Advisory Committee. Whether it's a task force or a club board, the overlying theme of contention that reverberates through this community is that communication is key. I know that the first step to any project or financial process is to establish a trusting relationship. Let the stakeholders know up front what's going on. The next step of the financial process is to collect information, which requires open communication. And next, a vision and goals can be established that reflect opportunities to improve weaknesses and build strengths. With incoming board members, and at some point a new superintendent, I hope that Fairfield can learn to improve its planning process and thereby create a strong communication plan that builds a trusting relationship with the district. It's important as a homeschool family that I let this board know that one, I am a direct stakeholder in this discussion. Two, I would appreciate timely, open communication concerning agenda items that directly affect me. Three, I would love to discuss with the district ways to improve our homeschool program. Four, I would appreciate it if our homeschool staff and educators knew the budget with which they had to work. Five, I would like to have my students' educational needs met before the money is transferred. After all, section 98.12 subsection three states, flexibility account, all or a portion of the amount remaining unexpended and um, unobligated at the end of a budget year beginning on or after July 1st, 2017, may be transferred for deposit into a flexible account established under Iowa Code 298A.2, provided that all statutory requirements of the Homeschool Assistance Program have been met, including funding all requests for services and materials from parents or guardians of students eligible to access the program. Again, I said mine have not all been met. Number six, I would like the homeschool program to find stability rather than frequent upheaval and sub re subsequent redesign. I've been part, like I said, 13 years. We've moved no less than five times. So that's a lot of, re I, they were behind the high school. They were in the basement of the nursing home. They were in the old Lincoln school. They were in a uh, wrestling room and now they're upstairs at the middle school, just in the time that I've been here. May I ask that no decision be made concerning homeschool funds until more stakeholders have received effective communication. There are some great things that we could do with these funds that would benefit both the program and the district. 
please postpone your vote until all stakeholders have been informed and allow time to collect information about a proposal. Please designate, <clears throat> this one's important. Please designate a committee to work with all groups that have carryover funds. Homeschool's not the only one. There's a lot of money sitting there unused. As the board, you really need to have somebody that looks over that and reaches out to those people and says, hey, you've got this money that's designated specifically for this group. Let's find ways and work together that that money's used that year, hopefully, and goes towards that group. Uh, personally, that sounds to me like what the School Improvement Advisory Committee should do uh, to approach categorical funding stakeholders and ensure that it's used. Uh, either, uh, other Iowa school districts have benefited from strong homeschool funds and programs. For example, in 2017, when these funds were first opened up to be moved into a flex fund, Iowa City's homeschool program approached Mid Prairie, which is one of the best programs in the state, to learn successful ideas for funding issues. They chose to allocate $100 to each family for educational materials. Fairfield has recently lost homeschool families to Van Buren because that program offers a $200 educational material stipend in addition to services. Under the HF 565 legislation, the Marion District chose to move its homeschool carryover money to a flex account that could be used for facilities. They proposed a new community learning center in their old Emerson Elementary. The former elementary school now houses the homeschool program, as well as before and after school programming, adult learning, and a community center. Mid Prairie's program also expanded into the former Washington Township School, giving them access to a gym, kitchen, and more classrooms. There are ways that if given time that we can benefit both the district and the homeschool program and utilize these funds as they were intended. Upon word of the public hearing, another Fairfield parent reached out to me, <clears throat> and this is a parent that open enrolls their kids to another district. And here's the quote that I got from them. I feel that this is sadly typical Fairfield fashion, where we wait till the last minute to put out info to those who are directly involved. There is a lack of communication, and it seems purposeful. Then at the last minute, there is information put out there in a minute meeting with the board that is nothing more than show because they have already made up their mind, but to save face, go through the motions. Ouch. Why wouldn't they send this out to the mass message so the district, know, district knows? Why are they so reluctant to share this information with the district? I agree. Please make a decision that builds trust and starts to break down the typical, typical notices that Fairfield stakeholders have. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else? Are you in regards to the homeschool, homeschool public hearing? Or public? Oh, I'm sorry, homeschool. Oh, yeah, the public comment's coming later, and I got your phone up there. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn the public hearing? No, wait, do I need a motion or do I just adjourn? No, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we will adjourn the public hearing at 6.54. And we will start our, our other, I'm gonna read the statement. The regular monthly board meeting of the Board of Directors of the Fairfield Community School District is to be held at 6.30 p.m. on the third Monday of each month. The meeting is open to the public and the public is encouraged to attend. Time is provided in the meeting for the public input. The mission of the Fairfield Community <coughs> School Board of Directors is one Fairfield where relationships foster growth, protect learners, unlock individual potential, and serve every student every day. Can I get a roll call, please? Mark Porter. Here. Tim Bauer. Here. Ty Ward. Present. Chrissy Welsh. Here. Frank Rose. Here. Margot. Here. John. Here. And do we have any uh, perfection, anything to perfect in the agenda? No. 
Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. And can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes. So we have our guests, we have our uh, FFA students here tonight. Come on in. Yeah, come up into the mic and face us, please. Um, hi. Hi. I'm here with fellow members that went to National FFA Convention this year, this past um, October. And we're just going to give you a little presentation about things we learned, things we did, and different things about National Convention. Hi. So I'm Brianna Steele, and I'll let them introduce themselves as they go through their slides. Thanks. My name is Taylor Reller. I need the next slide. So we went to Fair Oaks Dairy where the FFA members toured the farm. So we ate lunch and got ice cream. And then we went to the indoor playground, went down the slide. And we also went on a bus to tour the farm where we went down. We went on the Dairy Adventure and the Pig Adventure. On the dairy venture, we learned about dairy cows, the robotic dairy, and how to milk cows. On the pig adventure, we were able to see the baby pigs to full grown and pregnant cells. While we were on the pig adventure, we also got to see seven-day-old baby pigs. They were really tiny. And then there's some pictures. So, like, we got to see different things. Nice. Okay, I'm Emily White. Um, we went to the Ozark Fisheries. Um, we got to tour it and learn about how they do it all. We got to see where the babies were born, and we got to see how they were all taken care of. Next, we got to go to the ponds and see how they rotated the fish. Then we got to go try to catch the fish with our hands. <laughs> and finally, we watched them prep the fish for their new homes and how they um, got them ready to ship. And can you introduce yourself? Oh, yes. I'm Aiden Porter. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Brock Metz. Um, the FFA chapter went to the Tunneled Orchard, which is an apple orchard, and we got to go through and see all the how their trees were grown from baby to old. And then we also went and seen how they processed their cider and their apples. And then they let us taste test it for free and eat apples. Hi, I'm Carson Lovelady. And at the Beasley's Orchard, we got to do many activities like going through a corn maze, shooting apples through an apple cannon, and bouncing on their jumping pillow. We also got to go into the loft of the barn and hear the presentation on the orchard. And they're like a family-owned company that's been through four generations, I think. And um, we talked to the head guy currently, and he just gave us information on their sunflower, strawberry, apple, and pumpkin plant. And on the next slide, we have some pictures of the of the two orchards we went to. <coughs> wow. uh, like I said, I'm Brianna Steele, and I'm going to talk about um, National Convention itself. So along with going to National Convention, we also went to other um, tours and stuff like they explained, where we learned more about different things that don't happen in the state of Iowa or that aren't as common. So at National Convention, it's held in Indianapolis, Indi Indianapolis, Indiana, and it's an annual event there. It's in the Colts Stadium along with a big exhibit hall. In the exhibit hall, there's shopping malls, there's workshops, and keynote speakers. Um, we listened to keynote speakers and um, went to the workshops, and of course, we stopped at the shopping mall. Um, there's FFA members from all 50 states and also at the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico. So... One of our things to do while we went there was to take a picture with someone from each state and talk to them. So we, um, as a group, got pictures with kids from all 50 states and Puerto Rico, but we could not find the Virgin Islands. So that's the only one we missed. And it was said that they weren't able to make it. So we did pretty good, I think. Um, 
when you're there, you meet people from other states, you make connections, you network, you talk with businesses. Um, there's a big uh, open area where there's a bunch of businesses lined up. It's called the exhibit hall. There's a bunch of businesses and different colleges and you just go and talk and it's really fun. They hand out prizes and everything too. Um, but while we were there, like I said, meeting new people and stuff, we went out to supper with a group from Missouri. Um, we also met new people at our hotel and stuff. So overall, it's just a great experience. And there's some pictures there of us in front of the Lucas Oil Stadium, which is where the Colts play. So that's pretty cool. And then just overall at convention. Thank you, guys. Were there, Thank you. Were there other clubs from Iowa there as well? Yes. Yeah. So how many kids do you think were there total? Yeah, like 75,000. I mean, that place is packed. Like, you're running through bumping shoulders. It's like Black Friday shopping. There, right there, the person that's over in Indianapolis almost said to us that they have to maybe build another building Yeah. Within the, like, future five years, they're saying that they have to build a whole new building just for us to come because there's so many people. Is it always in Indianapolis? Yes. It used to be held in different places, but there's a contract that it has to be held in Indiana, Indianapolis for so many years now. Wow. And so how many of you, was this your first time going? So this was my third time going, but it was all of their first time going. Nice. And it's a great opportunity for anybody that gets to go. We've got our takeaways, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. There's, there should be another slide with takeaways that they'll come back up. Um, one of my big takeaways that I learned was how to write a proper essay, and I learned about powerful questions. Nice. Um, I learned how different states do different things um, through FFA and just like everything. One of the biggest takeaways I had was uh, just seeing all the, like the colleges and the different careers that were there, like their vendors and stuff, <laughs> learning more on them. My biggest takeaway was there, there's many career paths and there's for different people and there's always somebody there from different states or different companies or colleges to help you through it and help you learn about the career you want to pursue. Nice. Thank you guys for giving us your time to take show us your present our presentation sure. about National Faith Convention. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming. It's always the highlight to see to have you guys come and uh, share with us what you're working on. So, you gonna try to go back? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On to superintendent update, Stephanie. Sure, John will be pulling it up there. So it, um, there's a lot uh, to update, and um, you know, with a lot going on tonight, I'll um, like most months try to keep it uh, fairly short. Feels like it's been a while since we've had um, a regular board meeting, so there's definitely been a lot going on. Um, the month of November is filled with well, I think that every month and every week is filled with uh, you know some unique celebration or unique. Um, thing happening in our in in different buildings so the pictures are really highlighting things that were going on across the district um, there were veterans day celebrations across the um, in each building i'm sure the highlight was for our sixth grade where they had incoming board member uh, dave eastburn and our very own evan martin uh, there to present um, you know the uh, assembly at the high school is always a, a really great time as well that's what the picture on the bottom right is from um, other building uh, highlights included um, the annual Pence trip, day into night field trip, they do that. They did that this year at the fairgrounds. Um, Washington had an emergency vehicle visit, um, and then we kind of rounded out the um, fall activities um, and sports season. Um, Will Larson uh, placed fifth and set a uh, new state or new personal record and school record um, in the 100 backstroke. And our esports um, smash team took fourth place. Um, here uh, within the last week and a half. So um, always lots of student highlights. Um, the, the picture there at the top um, is from the two TQ days. So those are two professional development days um, that we typically um, put into the calendar um, right around the election. Um, so that Monday and Tuesday 
the first Monday and Tuesday of November is oftentimes PD. Um, this year, they really focused um, on kind of on digging into our portrait of a Trojan. Um, so that's something that we've continued to update throughout that process, dating all the way back to last year at this time. So it was an opportunity for teachers to really dig into what those enduring skills or competencies are, what they look like uh, for our students. It also connects to the first uh, update for the for my superintendent goal areas that the board has established for me. So the first. Uh, goal is for is for me to establish an action plan for 80% of our SIAC recommendations. The first recommendation from SIAC was around communicating with parents around that portrait of a Trojan. It's also connected to what's coming up. I know at the board table um, at different work sessions and here at regular meetings, we've been giving updates uh, around the, the Fairfield brand. And so tying all of that together to really push forward or to roll that portrait out um, in January, the public can expect to see um, to, to see more about that and to, to really focus on that communication out to not only parents, but I think the additional benefit to that is that in communicating and being intentional in our communication to parents, that's gonna get out to the, to the broader community as well and understanding uh, what our students, staff, and community have identified as priorities in, in building as skills uh, in our students from throughout their entire time through our system. Um, a couple other things that are coming up. Chocolate Sunday is this Sunday, right? The third is this Sunday. So we're already like getting into uh, December and so that's always a, a fun event at the middle school. Uh, we have uh, a work session that we want, well we have a regular work, could have a regular work session next Monday, but we've got an, an additional work session uh, with Larry Siegel from Iowa School Finance uh, that will be, he'll be zooming in. We're gonna host that in the auditorium next Tuesday at the regular, what has been our regular uh, board time at 6.30. Uh, so that's an opportunity for staff, for community to learn about the projection models uh, for school finance, to get kind of a school finance 101. Um, I hope to kind of uh, potentially be out in the crowd collecting questions as they come in, not necessarily an opportunity to answer every question. I don't know what that might look like, but to kind of um, facilitate that in a way uh, that Larry's informing the public, informing our staff, um, new board members regarding you know the financial state of the district and just Iowa School Finance as the fundamentals of Iowa School Finance. So that's 630 on the 5th at the high school auditorium? Correct. Yep. And we will make sure that we're pushing out. Um, you know, I know Evan's got some things set to go out uh, over the next week uh, as reminders with that. Uh, and do you know what time Chocolate Sunday is? I think it starts at 2 p.m. Yeah. have that in my calendar. I'll double check that here in just a second. But I believe that's 2 o'clock. Um, the other thing I always want to update uh, when we meet here monthly um, is on the other superintendent goal area that, that you all have um, provided for me in um, maintaining visibility with time in buildings and in community building. And so I use that um, feature in our Google Calendar that kind of allows me to um, categorize all of the different things that I do uh, within each day, each week, and over the month. And so for the month of October, um, that came out to be 13% um, in community building uh, activities or events and 17.3% um, in the building. And so there's been a lot going on in buildings and um, I always do my best to um, support and again, you know, be visible. Mm -hmm. A couple of challenges and solutions. Uh, we continue through the budget package writing um, following that directive around uh, maximizing revenue, stabilizing expenses. We've had productive uh, work session collaboration with our um, administrators and directors, kind of finalizing what those packages look like, focusing on some of the non-people expenses that we have as well. Uh, and then I definitely wanted to hit on the Iowa School Performance Profile uh, and highlight that we continue to partner with the AEA, uh, specifically around areas for improvement um, in each building. So we're looking at, um, this past week, we went to Burlington. A team from the district went to Burlington uh, to really focus on that transition um, from specific with special education students in special education transition to their post secondary lives. So we looked deep at data concerning how many go straight to work, how many pursue uh, post secondary education, military, and then what what programming and what. Um, supports do we have not just in high school because it is the culmination and so that's kind of where the data 
shows you some things, but recognizing that that really does begin when you, you know, walk in as a preschooler or a kindergartner. So obviously that then ties back to that portrait work and building a more cohesive, connected, intentional system as, as students transition through. Uh, so definitely some highlights in the school performance profile, but also it indicates some opportunities for improvement as well. And um, we also have a team going this week to work on our district career. Acad DCAP, I forget what that acronym stands for, but it's around career um, planning. And so what that looks like, again, that's that's maybe feels more high school specific, but it starts, um, you know, very early on in, in kind of exploring what students are interested in, what they're passionate about, developing those skills and um, getting feedback along the way. So it's been a very busy um, November. I guess the other um, highlight that I would want to bring everybody's attention to is we had a really um, great time at the IASB convention um, at one point or another all incoming and returning board members were there participating and so it was a great opportunity for us to learn together again around finance around governance um, and looking at what you know what the priorities for the board are um, and helping to make this um, transition that's you know here upon us shortly um, the most successful it can be so Great month of November, and December will fly right by, as we know, that time between Thanksgiving and the end of the year uh, goes very quickly. And before we know it, we'll be um, to 2024. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, on to unfinished business. Can I get a motion to approve the purchase of MacBooks, iPads, iPad cases, and Apple pens to be used in the homeschool assistant program for the cost of $10,312.75. So moved. Second. And discussion? <clears throat> well, it certainly relates to some of the stuff we're hearing in the public hearing, which there's a separate motion for that later. But uh, I'm generally always in favor, um, but if there's, are, do we know, are these items going to be staying in the in the classrooms? Are they to be loaned out? Um, what's the idea with this equipment? I think that could be either or or both. Um, I do think we heard in the public hearing um, some examples of outdated technology, so in preparation mm -hmm. uh, for the discussion and the possibility of transferring funds into the flex fund which again doesn't mean that they can't still be used for homeschool it just opens that up to be used for um, additional general fund expenses uh, that prior to doing that i had met with homeschool uh, with homeschool staff to say what mm -hmm. current needs are are unmet and one of the first things they went to is i mean we really have these outdated we have outdated technology and so that's reflected here um, with the recommendation that you have before you Is a lot of their curriculum online then, the uh, homeschool? It's a combination of all of, of the above. Um, and so um, I appreciate the um, reference to homeschool being that personalized education. Uh, if, if there's a need, um, I think it would be dependent on the level of the learner, the, the skills of the parents, guardians, wants, needs of, you know, in providing that. Uh, so I think it's a combination of things. Um, it could be physical textbooks that are checked out through that lending library, or it could be resources that are available um, online. It could be connecting with um, entities in the broader community or elsewhere, um, what might be accessible at the public library, uh, learning experiences in a range of contexts. Anything else? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve the transfer of the unexpended and unobligated funds in the amount of $375,000 from the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023 into the flexibility account from the homeschool assistant program in accordance with HF 565. So moved. Second. 
and discussion. You made a comment just a few seconds ago about the funds can still be used for homeschool, even though it gets moved to the flex uh, spending account or flex count. So the money is not going away from there. It's just not earmarked for that program, right? Correct. And then to spend those funds outside of homeschool, that does require a public hearing um, and further approval from the board. So if we still have to have another public hearing to spend the funds outside of the funds, then why do we even need to transfer it at this point would be my question. So tonight, um, the public hearing tonight is not a required um, part of the process. Mm -hmm. And Evan, I, I don't believe that the approval to transfer them is um, is a requirement. No, so you do not need a public hearing to transfer the funds into the flex account, but dating back to the program-based budgeting of maximizing revenues, stabilizing expenses. I thought in order to be more transparent, we should have a public hearing of an opportunity to use funds in a different uh, highlight or a different category, but it takes board action to spend those funds down the road. So what you would see is come close out, I'd come with a list with a public hearing, like here's everything we want to use flex funding money on, and you guys go yes or no after the public hearing. So why can't we just do both these steps at a later date? Why do we have to do this tonight? That would be my question. There's really no reason to do it. Didn't tonight. have to do a public hearing at all. But I understand why do we have to vote this through, you know, at this point, would be my question. It just allows the funds to be moved to where they could be more visible to be used for other things, right? Correct. So it would put, provide a more up-to-date balance sheet, move forward. You'll see $375,000 sitting in a flex spending account. And as I do financial updates, you can see like, hey, what are you planning on spending that for? Oh, we want to use it for that now. Oh, this facility project came up. This staffing need came up. This negotiations topic came up. Let's, we have that pot of money designated and ready to my earmark, but it also helps me create a budget and the program-based budgeting of what are we using that? The other thing on? I would bring um, for consideration and just for overall uh, communication to the board and to the public, uh, over the last five years, <coughs> um, the students served in homeschool have gone, uh, have ranged from 88 um, in the 21-22 school year to 59 um, this year. So that certified enrollment, again, I think we heard about that in the public forum um, that homeschool is weighted at 0.3 and so you would take those students served multiplied by that 0.3 to get the certified enrollment which is then what we get uh, funding you know uh, that gets multiplied by our district cost per pupil so we currently have a, this year's most recent certified enrollment um, is 17.7 and that is down slightly from the 26.4 which was kind of the height of um, the last several years um, the district uh, cost per pupil is a, a number that changes every year that's dependent on uh, SSA. So, you know, this year it's 7,635. Um, and so our 17.7 .7 certified enrollment multiplied by that district cost per pupil gives a budget to the homeschool program for this year at 148,882. So around $150,000. Um, that would be this year's allocation. And over the last five years, it's ranged from that one, about 150 to 195. Um, and I think we heard about this, you know, previously as well, that it's like all areas of our system that the majority of the, the budget is allocated towards staff. Um, during that time, I know we heard about this specifically. We current, when we entered this school year, um, we currently have the highest staffing in homeschool um, with two full-time teachers and a part-time uh, administrative assistant. Even with the recent uh, resignation of a part-time uh, teacher, we're still at that full um, 2.0 FTE, and there's a little bit of flexibility there as we um, continue to work through meeting the needs of all the students that are currently enrolled. So we were um, really making sure or um, prioritized that students that were currently in the homeschool program would not lose access to the homeschool program with that resignation that was approved at the um, at the last board meeting, um, and so. Uh, the other thing I would add for consideration that even given the everything that we've that's been discussed already transferring that out doesn't allocate those funds directly to any I mean it just makes it more flexible at this point um, it does still a lot for a fifty seven thousand uh, dollar so we, the, the at the end of fiscal year 23 so at the end of June last year we had four hundred and thirty two thousand dollars 
in carryover. Um, so that's unobligated funds after um, the, the, the needs of that program as requested um, had been met. Um, that would be earmarking still 57, right? 32, 432 minus 375, 57. Um, thousand dollars that we would leave in carryover funds along with the carryover funds from this year so there is some flexibility there to specifically address I think the concerns and questions that were brought up um, and as we work to do that again those three hundred and seventy five that three hundred seventy five thousand dollars would take enough will take the other um, public hearings so. now, now two quick questions I would have is, is if uh, we were I think you said 90 students a couple years ago or whatever it is and you said it was down to 59 now mm -hmm. is that correct why are we seeing that drop? Is it because of graduation or going to a different district to get the resources? Mm -hmm. And the other question that I would have is, is uh, if we have so much money sitting in that account, why are they using so much outdated technology and why are they not getting access to the stuff that they need that they clearly are expressing that they want and need? I can only speak to, so I, I oversaw homeschool um, last year as well. So yep. this has been about a year and a half um, for me. And I, the requests that have come through, whether that was for field trips, um, we did buy it, purchase new, um, some new textbooks, curriculum, high school, English, um, something else at the beginning of the year, the technology. Um, I, I don't want to say um, with 100% certainty that I've never denied a request because there could be something I'm missing, but I, I can't think of something that has been denied in the in the time that I've been directly um, but clearly like working the with the homeschool. textbooks that they're expressing like using you know thirty year old textbooks. I mean, are I mean what are they needing to do to get those updates and what do we need to do to provide that for them? I guess because that is out of date stuff, you know. Um, I think it goes back to part of what we heard around you know identifying what those what those are, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's something that we can that we work on and we are continuing to say you know earmark. <laughs> That homeschool money that would stay in the homeschool account for for those purposes. I feel like some of the answer was in the comment of the public hearing, which is mirroring the rest of the district. If there's not a, a a clear budget where programs are prioritized, then you don't know how much you can spend, right? And you can get into a mode of operation where you say, "Well, we don't know. We can try to ask for things, or we can try to just work with what we got." And it feels to me like an endorsement of the, the program-based budgeting process, right? It needs to extend to the homeschool assistance program, too. Say, this is the budget that's allocated, and you can now plan. You can make it not just a plan for this year, but a five-year plan and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that in all areas of the district where there's a, when a request comes in, makes the best effort to try to understand if, it, we can afford it right now and try the best to approve it. But that doesn't have the long-term benefit that budgeting has, right? So to me, this seemed like both really important issues of what, what fund the money is in, but also the strength of having a budget and the, the limitations of not having a budget. And we're seeing, seeing some of the results of it, right? Um, and I, I'd agree what I suppose my concern would be is at this moment is, is that it feels like, and it, I think that it sounds like the superintendent is, is saying this, but um, that that there needs to be this improvement of communication and process for making sure that that um, requests are in fact actually being identified and are in fact being acted upon when possible. And it's unclear from the comment whether or not that process has actually been, it doesn't sound like it has been taking place for the last several years, which is of great concern. Um, um, I, I myself was involved in the, in my, one of, and our children were in the homeschool program, and, and I, I saw it up, up, up close, both in terms of the commitment of the staff and the struggles over resources. Um, so my point here is, is that I would feel much better if we reversed the process and made good on our commitment to improve communication and process before we move the money. Because what would concern me is, is that we move the money and the second part never happens. And right now, I don't think, think we have a, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we have a good record on making sure that that second part indeed happens. 
my biggest concern is we go on ahead and move the money and okay, yes, we still have to approve it, but you know, this kind of gets in the rearview mirror and we forget, you know, of all the needs that they have and all then all of a sudden they don't have the funds to get what they need, but clearly they have a lot of needs there that we need to make sure get met. Do you guys feel like the program based budgeting process would work for this or not? It's included. <coughs> Absolutely. So all these categorical funds that you see on the balance sheet, like even below the highlighted one on here, right. that's all included in the program-based budget. Yeah. So it all flows through the general fund. So, so there's separate categories right now. So you'll see homeschool <coughs> assistance program, um, categorical, whatever the 148,000 and some change was for this year's budget within that program. I guess my biggest question is, is still, I mean, why do we have to, you know, uh, yes, we have to approve it again later, but why do we even have to take this step tonight, I guess, is my the question. I mean, I don't want to make your job harder, but by the same token, I want to make sure their, their needs are met, you know, so. It's just a planning thing. tool. I mean, the sooner we do it, the sooner we can plan for next steps on the budget process. I mean, you don't have to approve it tonight. Um, it just kind of delays everything we're trying to do. Um, so that's the only reason. So there's no... I guess one thing I'd also like to see is why aren't we at the end of the year, if there's carryover money, if there's not a request, that automatically gets put into the flex account so that it's, you, we, but like every, all the other funds, you have this amount of money, we need to be utilizing it, and if we don't, then it needs to go where it can be used elsewhere. Yeah. And then if you look back, I mean, two years, uh, FY22, there was $400,000 sitting there. So a lot of money. Agreed, and that's the thing, right, is, is that if we establish a process where everyone knows what the process is, they know what the debt, it's like the federal government, right? You know what the deadline is, you know that if you don't spend your money, then you're gonna lose it, but everybody knows the rules, and right. they all and they make sure that everything gets done by the time. And and so that's what I feel like, is is that there's gotta be a process. It, uh, well, isn't once that this money, uh, I'm sorry, Christy, just one more thing, I, I apologize. Once the money gets moved, I think the likelihood that it will actually get spent on the category for which it was originally Earmarked is exceedingly low, and I, I think that that is just a fair thing to point out. And I would agree with that, John. So. And do you what? guys think that program-based budgeting wouldn't address that? That if the stakeholders who agree on priorities and if they say, you know, we want this spent here, that it that it wouldn't? That Maybe in the future. I apologize. I should. Be Christy, you well, that's just what I was going to say. Reiterate what Frank was saying is is that is what the program-based budgeting is to help create that process. Mm -hmm. Right, so that going forward, <clears throat> everybody is aware of what they have in each budget. But I, I understand. I, I just feel like it's in this moment of transition that, that there's a kind of good faith, mm -hmm. there's an act of good faith to, to build, in the, build in the time for the lag. And you, but, as you guys are aware, I've back to Tim's point a little bit is, obviously I started July 1. And I started writing to close out. So September 15th, I closed out. And it's when I first sight at seeing these balances. Um, and seeing some very, very high balances on top of the budget projection that we're heading towards. So in my practice and in my schooling, when you see a huge balance like that, you propose a flex transfer to the board. And it's the board's decision to either do it or not do it. Right. So to me, this is a common thing that should have been going before the board, uh, which is why I'm bringing it before the board now. Um, for your guys' decision? I think what I look at is as long as their needs are being met, it's common sense, yes, you transfer the funds, but the biggest concern right now, do are their needs being met? We have obviously people that are claiming that it's not. You know, I think that we truly need to figure out if they have everything there that they need, <clears throat> they're getting everything there that they need. Once we know that those needs are met, then we can use their funds for other things. We gotta make sure we're serving them first because that's really what earmarked for them first, right? Yep. So I mean, so clearly they're is. not getting what they need. So, so I think that I think that we missed a step here. Is what was what I'm saying before we transfer it. When we were at the convention, was it last two weeks ago? Uh, you know, in the finance classes, this is one of the first things they tell you. If you've got unspent balances, move them to a flex account. Mm -hmm. And we should have been doing this before, like you said. We haven't been doing it. Um, the fact that it can be moved in there and we can still spend it on everything that homeschool is awesome. Uh, oh, I, Mid Prairie is brought up. Everyone that was at the convention knows I was kind of semi-obsessed with Mid Prairie also <laughs> there um, when I heard about their 380 students that they have in their homeschool program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would love to steal and borrow and anything from their program and make our program, you know, one of the best also. Um, you know, we did a lot of talking around that while we were at the convention. 
Um, this is also the, the fact that we haven't done flex fund yet up to this point is kind of, you know, odd to me. Uh, if you look around the state, uh, you know, over 100 districts have, you know, added to their flex fund or created a flex fund in the last four years. Um, this is a very, very common thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, I want this money to be spent, you know, meeting the needs that we have on homeschool. Um, but I don't see this step as, as hindering that whatsoever. We're not cutting any spending. We're not uh, doing anything like that. We're taking a balance from years previous and just earmarking it as something else. And then you can still spend anything you want from that. But if we had met their needs, that would make sense. And the thing is, is clearly we haven't been. So clearly there's been a broken step there, right? So I feel like that if, that, if those funds were earmarked for that program. Cool. Well, here's just a math implication. Not that it means do it or don't. But my understanding with program-based budgeting is there's going to be a, a, a top-line number, right? And anything that doesn't fit within there after it's been prioritized is cut, right? Mm -hmm. Doing this or not doing this is going to affect what that number is. Mm -hmm. And so yes. that doesn't mean that, you know, if homeschool assistance stuff is prioritized, right, it doesn't hinder it from being spent on that. But the challenge is going to be the stuff that's beyond that number is gone, right? And this is affecting that number. So that, again, that doesn't mean don't earmark it or do. It just means that's an implication of voting on this. Before but, program based budget. So we talked about mid prairies. So the reason they have 380 homeschool kids is that because kids are coming in from other districts and then they're getting an allotment to put money towards that, or how does that work exactly? Some is that. Some is the population of uh, community. the community. Yeah. And I mean, they've historically had a strong, I mean, they have, a, I think we, uh, it was alluded to, a building and administrator. I mean, they have, um, I don't, I can't say that it's the biggest homeschool program in the state, but. Because some of the bigger districts, like if you think about Des Moines Public or Cedar Rapids, they just have so much more population um, that, that it could be bigger. But definitely for the size, um, you know, that, that Mid Prairie is. Um, I know a guy that works there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if we had questions, uh, you know, specifically. Sure, I know even talking sorry. about the, um, uh, with the homeschool staff today, um, they mentioned the same. And so that's not, that's not a place that's far away. Um, you know, to, to tap into that. Uh, I will say that in, in preparation for tonight, the conversation that I had with the homeschool staff with the homeschool staff was to say, what needs do you currently have? And that's what you see before you right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so there have been a few other requests earlier in the year, as I mentioned, that um, probably, you know, didn't come in the form of because it wasn't to the $10,000. Um, again, for some high school English text. I don't remember everything I was on it, so I don't want to leave something out um, that and, and, and try to say that that's not equally as important to the other things that they um, have requested. So, um, well, that's kind of confusing, right? Because we had this through line in the public hearing of not enough materials, materials are too old. You know, that was pretty consistent. And you went and said, what do you need? And there's not, all that stuff's not on, on the big list, right? And, and some of that would just be the stakeholders that you talk to. But I think that's where that there's a broken step there. So what do you think? Why do you think then that? I mean, I mean Stephanie the, asked the teachers, "What do you need?" And they didn't say this stuff. Where's the broken part? Do you think? I, I don't know, but clearly I last year. I just mean, what do you it's think? Their first year, they're all new. They're all new staff this year. They just started. They're, they're just getting their bearings too. And they're not, all not aware of this until just a couple. Um, of years. Okay. There we need again. There's uh, a balance. And nobody, I, nobody's saying that we don't want to support mm -hmm. homeschool, oh, no. um, or that. Um, again, I, I we've already hashed out a lot of those talking points. Um, so if that's if that's continued conversation, if if maybe Frank they weren't, um, you know, aware that that yeah. applied to Materials, textbooks or yeah. curriculum, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I would again say that the fifty-seven thousand dollars are the budget or the allocation for homeschool Plus. has been one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand uh, dollars over the last, you know, most recent history, um, and we would be looking at uh, the projected carryover from this year plus that fifty-seven thousand that would still be carried over from previous years, along with next year's uh, allocation. 
Um, the, the enrollment has been going down some, um, and with a lower enrollment, any change in enrollment is going to have, you know, a bigger impact to that, um, to that programming. Mm -hmm. um, agree that there's opportunity to, just like we've talked about around enrollment in general, not just in homeschool, to understand that better, um, to research why that may be the case. I'm sure it's not one thing. It's multifaceted. Um, when you're talking about these numbers, what are you looking at for um, next school year? So next school year would be whatever the certified enrollment is this year, the 17.7, mm -hmm. times next year's district cost per pupil, which would be the 7635 plus whatever SSA, SSA is. Um, so if you just took it times this year's district cost per pupil, um, that's like 135 um, plus that projected 80 or 90,000 that we would have in carryover. Now, some of that would get spent down because I think at the very end of the day, regardless of what the board decides here, the, the attention and that this has, the information that we've been able to get from this, um, to Frank's point, um, that it all began with this idea of program-based budgeting and maximizing our revenues, stabilizing expenses. It has caused us to take a deeper look at where all dollars are being spent. Um, and so... I believe, I mean, we heard consistently that people didn't know what their budget was um, in the past. It's not a complicated uh, number to, to, to figure out. It's not something that Evan and I have, you know, been trying to hide in any way. So we want people to know what that budget is. We also want to create a sustainable, uh, also programs to be sustainable too. So if our budgets are around 150 to 200,000, we don't want to create a program that's routinely spending <coughs> over what that allocation would be. Um, and so I do think that takes some time and some input and, and a process for, so for lack of a better One of the things I've heard is if we move it to a flex account, we're not necessarily taking it from the homeschool program, but how are we going to make sure that we don't use those funds for something else first before they determine they need something that this could have been used Well, it has for. to be board it approved. approved. It has to be approved by the board. So, it has to be approved by the board, but how are we going to know? <clears throat> well, no, you'll no. be able to question and make sure if you... You know, you'll have that ability as a board member Those to question when, and make sure that it's getting used if that's something. Well, of course, that. we'll have that ability. But the thing is, is how are we going to know that they have the opportunity to reach out to us and, and make sure that they don't have first dibs for the money, I guess would be my question. Well, like, if they need something, how are we going to know that they're going to be contacted and they're going to have the opportunity to request those funds first before we spend it on something else? That's my question. Well, they're going to know what their annual budget is based on the buckets. That, right, and I would have... But the other thing is all the other groups that have additional funds should be done the same way. Correct. Right. All this money needs to be put in that major category and then pulled out as needed if it's carryover funds. I think moving forward, I think this is a great practice, absolutely. I'm just trying to make sure I do it prematurely, basically, at this point. And we're making sure that their needs have been met because right now, based on a little bit of information that I've heard, their needs aren't being met, and that's a concern because that money truly. Well, I think uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is a this is not for the public to speak right now. The big it's thing. Not the, the, okay. the big thing is, is there's been lots of funds left over from previous okay. years. I mean, we had almost four hundred thousand dollars left over that should have been brought in there years ago, a couple years ago, right? We're just it's cleaning up what needs to be done, and then there's a budgeted amount. They're still going to have. There's still a large amount of money available, plus what's additional mm -hmm. in that particular category, along with any additional requests they want to make. So it's all tracked. It's both, right? Clearly, material should have been purchased <laughs> during some of these exactly. previous years, too. And when enough materials had been purchased to satisfy the needs, the excess should have been transferred to the right. flex fund. Well, I mean, just to pick up, I mean, because I think this combines several of these lines, and that is something I want to hear from Evan. I mean, it, like, let's say that we don't. I mean, and of course, if we don't act on this, and, and Tim brings up a good point, which is that this isn't the only one that could be involved here, and so you could kind of have like a car crash kind of sort of scenario. But, but so Evan, you know, if, if, we, if we don't act on this, and particularly if there are several others that we don't act on for the similar reasons, what is a kind of timeline by which we would potentially run into a circumstance where we couldn't figure out how much the, the new giant pool was that would then have to be divided up? You understand my question? You know, in terms of the... The, the program-based budgeting. It, precisely. I mean, is there like a point, of like a, a, a point where we have to resolve all these things in order to, to do the second part of the process? 
Uh, it's kind of hard to answer. It's it's getting more and more challenging. So starting in January this year, we had to run our first public hearing for next year's budget, and that's everything tax levy. Um, come March, we're running another public hearing for the final budget for the following year. Legislation might not even be concluded by then where they could set limits on some of these fundings too. You can't carry over more than 5%, which they have done with other funds. Um, Program-based budgeting, I mean, we're getting closer and closer. We're hoping December, January, we're right on track to start rolling that out, but we're up at this window of kind of upper on where we're heading with all the other big upcoming things because we still have a lot of other big financial initiatives out there that we're going to discuss. Um, yeah. So if you kind of answer the question. Just hypothetically yeah. table it until the next regular board meeting there. You'd be getting right up to the, <coughs> to the line of whether this is included when you're deciding where the, the cutoff line is going to be for program-based budgeting. Presumably. Getting closer, yeah. So I think we have a financial <coughs> session December 5th, probably a little bit on December 4th. We have people coming in January 9th. I'm in budget workshops starting the week of January 7th, I believe. Um, prepping for public hearings, we need to talk about levies. We need to talk about next year instructional budgets, staffing, all that stuff within the next couple months. But if we move it in, okay, so we move it into a flex account, so you're able to take that into consideration for your general budget moving forward, but then then let's say the homeschool program comes back and says that they need all $300,000 in two months. So how do we handle that then at that point? I mean, how, how do you take that into consideration with the so budget? So we just pay for it out of the flex fund. So there's a project code on here, 1113, which yeah. says homeschool. Mm -hmm. The flex fund is like a 9510 project code. So on that annual, um, so if you look at the bill paying sheet, if you see a 9510 on there or 1113, you'll know the program that it came from. So if you see a 9510 on there next month, you'll be like, hey, Evan, I got a question about your board bills of why are you taking this out of the flex fund? And then Dr. Mishler and I can go, oh, we thought about this, but that comes out of public hearing down the road and can get transferred back into the gen general journal entry to move back. So if it moves into a flex <laughs> account, it can be used for the general fund, it can be used for the management fund, it can be used for any fund. It can be used for any general fund purpose. Just general fund purpose. Not management. And if we don't use it this year, there's no carryover limit currently on the flex fund, so we can carry that over the following year. So if we can't decide how we want to earmark that money this year, we're now still sitting there, so it prevents the potential 5% carryover rule that they've done on several other funds, not homeschool currently. Um, but it has been talked about. But then with that being said, back to Tim's point, they have added additional categoricals that can now be flex funded. It used to be TQ and homeschool only. Now there's other funds out there that can, yeah. And I guess what it, what it suggests is that any constituent group that is, has a particular interest in the spending of amounts in those funds, it, it, is, it obligates them to be very, very active in terms of keep following up with the board and knowing exactly where those dollars are and um, and uh, how they're being spent. Well, I would I would say follow up with um, Dr. Mishler and follow up with the go through the Indeed, the, the, the chain of the command. Chain hand, yes. Yeah. Follow, follow proper procedure. One of the things I like about the Flex Fund is it's the only budgeting tool we really have outside of approving board bills and anything over the board policies of $10,000 has 100% board discretion on if we spend it out of that pot of money or not. That's exactly right. Um, yep. And that's why I like the flex account. It all has to go before the board. You have to approve the expenditure. You have to host a public hearing. So I would say it's even up to the board to decide how they want to mm -hmm. allocate that money a little bit. I, I think the concept is good. Just my biggest mm -hmm. concern is clearly we have a, a homeschool program that in their minds are maybe struggling a little bit right now or might be behind other districts. And if, let's say, we go on ahead and we approve those expenditures for some other purpose in the district, you know, say here in three months, it's no longer available for them. I feel like that's detrimental to that program. And, you know, I think we could sit here and talk about all the advantages we have to having them as part of our district. But, I mean, we still want those kids to be a part of our extracurriculars. We still want them to attend classes when they need to. We, we want a thriving homeschool program. And I'm, I'm just <coughs> fearful that we're going to be crippling that if we're not careful. And I understand, yes, we have to approve it, but we sit through there's multiple controversial things that we'll have to, you know, talk about just tonight alone. You know, I mean, that money could be used in two seconds on something else. But it's know. a it's a public hearing, and 
approval process that you have to go through. It's not, I don't think it would be as. It's not going to just get used. Yeah. So, but to Mark's point, though, one thing that occurs to me is, yes, we always need to be very careful about ongoing expenses, right? And because of enrollment can change, but materials are not like that, right? And if this is representative that materials are 25 years old, et cetera, I get the feeling based on the number of students, you could buy a lot of materials for what people would need with, for example, the $100,000 approximately of extra that remain in the budget even after this transfer and you know the points that john and mark were making is well let's we want to make sure that we wait so that that can be funded if it's needed it sounds like it's needed now and it can be funded now mm -hmm. that's my point exactly yeah. but what i mean is like funded on monday the, but funded right? with, funded after these funds after these funds get transferred there's still there's could, still money in you could money say in like well we can wait years. on this and wait on that or you can say we can do this and do that right now Right. I don't want to see us hamstringing the project packets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's my biggest concern. This is a part of that process. It'll be a part of the process on how the money is spent. We can't tie our hands every time that type of request comes through, or we won't make or the budget process won't work. Right. It's it's the right thing to do, and it's not something that just got sprung on us. I know for the two years I've been on the board, I've seen that balance. Yeah. I've mm -hmm. talked to the previous SBO and the previous superintendent about that balance and about flexing it over. It never was done for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. We're doing it now. It's the right thing to do. It was then. Yeah. It's now. We can still use it for homeschool. It's, I agree with We that. can follow our budgeting process. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and let's do the same thing with the materials. Exactly. You know we need materials. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of money to spend on materials. Get that Probably should have done it a long time ago. Let's do it now. Yep. yep. I agree. I think we should do it now, and I think we should go ahead and vote. Well, I, I do have that one question for Dr. Mitchell. Can we spend a whole bunch of money on homeschool materials here in the next month? Yes. Yeah. Is there any spending cap per student or anything, spending authority that we have to be under? Again, I mean, I think we would follow the processes that we use. To, I mean, I don't think that it would be, <laughs> I don't want to get lost <laughs> financially, we right. want to be financially responsible. So any request that would come in is going to have to be Just considered. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, it, talking with the homeschool teachers today, we, we threw out some suggestions of, of possibilities that again would not be ongoing recurring right. expenses Materials. because this whole three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars or the four hundred and thirty two or whatever that carryover is that's taken years to build up right. and so we're not looking at I mean it wouldn't be possible to, to allocate that money to something that's going to be an ongoing hundred thousand dollar expense no. because we don't have the you know, that pot's not going to refill that quickly um, but as far you know to Frank's point um, as far as like the curricular resources again I would go to the you know the technology purchase here um, I do think that there's the opportunity for us to look at that lending library to see what's in those two classrooms and, and take it as an opportunity when I was just there this morning we were talking about um, what that takes to um, you know remove things rotate things and have a better idea of of what is um, needed there I know that we've gotten some emails here recently um, and it was shared in the in the public comment or in the forum as well um, you know on some ideas uh, of ways that we could um, better allocate the the resources or the budget that we get year in and year out but why would we move the funds and then fill the request why wouldn't we wouldn't we fill the request first and then move the funds but the funds are there there's still be funds available to fund those requests. Yeah. Absolutely, but the thing is, we're not gonna be able to fill every request that they make, and when we have to start denying requests, they're gonna assume it's because we already transferred their money that was already earmarked for them, and then we'll open up a whole other. But we don't, we, we don't. It's all public forums. If they yeah. think that we spend it, they can look through our minutes and they can see exactly where anything was spent. Yeah. Also, no but, I, but we don't We don't give everybody everything they want either. What's that? Um, not everybody gets everything they want either. It, well, they're not going to. to. That's 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 absolutely, that's all part of it, and that's why I'm right. saying, I think that we need to fill the requests that are reasonable first well, the, and then move the funds. The I think we'll be able to the fill opposite. them with the budget we have. We don't have we'll a little bit of fill some of them. Yeah. Let's, we'll, let's fill some, but we're going to I think there's a lot of, most of them when they come in, we're going to be able to fill them. <clears> but there's, there's always going to be a stuff. The fast. curriculum stuff that we're hearing, we can fill. We're talking about locations, buildings, classrooms. I'll call for a vote. Yeah, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, motion carries. Thank you.
Can I get a motion to approve the early retirement package? So moved. Second. And discussion? So what are the changes that we just made just uh, to go over them? Yep, so you would have the, um, the, have the most up-to-date that was um, reviewed by council um, in front of you. Um, similarly to what we talked about um, at the work session, if you go to page three, um, it outlines the lump sum payouts. Um, for employees with five to nine continuous years of 10% of their base salary, for employees with 10 to 14, I won't read it all, but the 20% base salary, 15 to 19 continuous years, 25%, 20 to 24, 30%, 25 to 29 is the 35% of the base salary. And then if you have 30 or more years, it'd be 40% of your base salary. That's almost identical to the last time that we ran um, the early retirement package three years ago, um, with the exception that it added in um, an additional um, employee group for that five to nine continuous years of service. Um, another change um, from an earlier iteration was the deadline of January 12th. Um, that's in compliance with the 45 days that are required to allow employees to, to consider the early retirement plan. Um, and then the other change was on um, the health insurance side um, that looks a little bit different from previous uh, times that we've offered early retirement. Um, we discussed at the work session uh, how important it would be or the advantage of, of using those um, the insurance uh, portion of the early retirement package to be paid into an HRA, um, to be paid out over three years instead of lingering for seven, eight years, um, and that, that then frees up uh, the employee or the, the retiring employee to um, decide what the best uh, health insurance for them, you know, they can take that to the, to the market and, and figure out, they can still elect to take our insurance uh, and, and come back into our system. Um, and so that would be uh, four and a half years of our current rate of individual insurance for a total of $37,500 paid out over those three years. And so the benefit to that payout over the three years, you know, just as a reminder, um, is the efficiency um, on, Evan's, on Evan's side of things and on his department's side of things. Um, I think those are the main, those are the key tenets of the, of the Oh, the other um, change then would be um, we, we do have 41 eligible employees um, and at the guidance of council and I think from some of the concerns that we heard um, from the board around that balance between um, filling, you know, offering retirement incentive or an, a retirement benefit at a time of staff shortage that we would cap the number of um, eligible participants to 20. On a first come, first serve okay, basis. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was going to ask. First come, first serve. First come. So it has to be signed, dated, and stamped by myself. So is the is the cutoff still 55 years of age it, and older? It has to be. Yep, yeah, that's a. Uh, that's that has to be 55. Correct. Now, have we gotten a breakdown of specifically what departments, what jobs it could potentially affect? Um, I mean, how many, so of the eligibility, do we have a breakdown of, okay, so how many people are in the maintenance department, how many people are associates, how many people are teachers, do we have a breakdown of that yet? So 12 teachers and 39, or 29 classified. Yeah. But at the classified, can we get a breakdown of, like, how many are bus drivers, how many are associates? So bus drivers would not be included because they're part-time, so it's all only for full-time full -time employees. Yep, okay. Um, so that excludes food service. Um, there are several... Um, within the district office that would be eligible. Wait, you said it exclu excludes food service. You mean transportation. Does it exclude food service as well if as bus part -time. drivers? If they do not get full-time benefits, they are not eligible for the early retirement program. Full-time. Okay, any, so we have both place. food service and transportation who are part-time. Correct. Right. Right. Okay. And we have some we student have employees who are part-time as well. I mean, so it's full-time employees. Um, so it's 10 to 12 teachers. Um, we got about 10, I would call district personnel that are under the classified, and then the other 20 would fall under um, by building classified staff. Secretarial, there would be some paras in there, um, other positions like that. But. Do we have an estimate, uh, like per early, early retirement package, like how much we might save ongoing? 
That is really hard to earmark. I think that's going to be a discussion for an upcoming um, work session because as we receive early retirement packages, I think we need to bring it before the board and the administrative team to decide on what could be attrition, what we for sure have to backfill. Um, so it's really hard to um, earmark exactly what that savings will be. Currently as a district, we are offering all years of experience, no matter what lane you are, for when we backfill positions. Um, so it's hard to budget from that standpoint as well. I only ask because I know I when Washington offered it like last year or whatever, I know in the news articles they were estimating about twenty grand per something like that in savings. That's a pretty safe okay. estimate. When you get into all the benefits and details of the financial picture. One concern I'd have with the first come first serve is this is kind of like a big life decision for the people involved. So mm -hmm. I'd want to make sure that the information got out there and then there was kind of a, a start time for this that wasn't as soon as you're hearing about it you know what I mean like first applications being accepted after whatever it is a week or two and yeah then, so if it were to pass tonight there is a push that will go out tomorrow morning and then we have our weekly staff updates so we'll send it out um, in order to be compliant and on track to meet next year's budget we do have to have it posted for that 45 days um, originally it was January 6th because we usually met on the third Monday and we pushed everything back a week. Mm -hmm. um, so it would have to go out almost immediately. Um, so there would be a push first thing tomorrow morning. Um, be our so, avenues that way. So yeah. you would be accepting applications as soon as it goes out? I would accept an application tonight as soon as it's board approved. So that, that's, that's a concern like, to me because now you got to race, right? And it's... It's a, I, I think we have a race, but another thing that I don't like about this is, you know, okay, so we have a race for the first 20 employees to come here, but, you know, we could have 20 people who have only worked for the district for six years get first precedence of this instead of a person that's worked for here for 28 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look at this, I know you guys are looking at this as a financial savings for the district. That's, while I look at it as a financial savings for the district, that basically boils down to a financial system that was designed by... Uh, people other than us, okay? So, I mean, the primary reason that we can afford to do this is because we have way too much sit money sitting right now in our management fund. The reason we have way too much money sitting in our management fund is because we have not been appropriately levying our property taxes really for a handful of years now. So we have this massive unspent balance in there that we really can't do much with. So the thing is, is essentially what we're doing is, is we're basically paying those people out of another account, essentially, so we can free up money in our general fund to save money because we don't know that we're gonna have a deficit. Well, that serves a terrific financial purpose there. I feel like that we are essentially encouraging a lot of good educators, especially ones who have only worked for the district for six or seven years to not teach in the district. So if we are to offer it, personally, I think that we should look at a much more narrow uh, group of people that are eligible, more so those people that have those upper years of continuous service, more like 15 to 30 years, instead of offering it to those people that only have six or seven years of continuous service. Because I feel like that we could potentially potentially offer it to a lot of people that haven't put near as much time in here, I guess is where I'm getting at. You yes. know, I have a lot of concerns about that with that cap of 20. Employees. So the other reason behind the cap of 20 is we get into Medicaid and Medicare laws. So if we want to offer it into an HRA um, per legal counsel, we couldn't have more than 20 people go into it because of age discrimination on the ones 65 and older, you had to cap it at 20. And I forget what the exact Iowa code is. It was one of those caps of like 20 if you want to be able to contribute to the HRA and offer that benefit mm -hmm. you have to cap it at 20 so you don't but if we have to cap it at 20 why don't we offer it to the people that have put the most years of service into the district first <clears throat> that's absolutely a decision you guys can make you guys um, can make motions to amend this and I want to we, we've done I've been a part of this once before and every way you go with it there can be major cost to the district like you're describing for example say you targeted it just at the most experienced teachers right those are our most experienced teachers. That's the reason I don't like this. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> yeah, I see. What I, I hear what you're saying, and and it's this is never to me a cut and dried one. There's pros and cons to mm -hmm. early retirement. Some of it is some of those most experienced teachers. They've said, "Hey, you know, I've been putting in these years, and this is a way for the district to sort of recognize that." Um, but yeah, that's the benefit I see to it. We're rewarding people for many years of hard work and service. That's what I love about it. The thing that I don't like about it is if you don't do it properly, you encourage people who have a lot of good years left to no longer teach. 
and yeah. I have a problem with that. Well, I and mean, if you look at the history of our district, too, some of our best teachers at 55, they still had a lot of more good years to teach. Absolutely. Decades. And they right. went through several opportunities for early retirement right. before yeah. they... Yeah. It, you got to remember, it's a personal decision. Yeah. Very personal. And we're not telling anybody to go fill this out tonight. And it's, it's personal. If they're in their life, is this is where they're ready to go, then it's probably the right thing for them to do. I mean... It's not Margo, up to us to gonna, decide that. You did it, right, Margo? I did. I did. I mean, it's up to the individual. It's, we're not standing over their back saying they got to go do this. So it's an opportunity to help reduce cost, of which we've got to do quickly, and at least we get, we've got a way to do it. We have to reduce costs, but I, I'm also fearful of, you know, using losing key teachers and oh, key employees yeah. at a time in which we're having trouble finding those yeah. educators it, for those courses. It's a scary thing no matter how you look at and it. And that's right? why I look at it more specifically for those people that have put in those massive years of service to the district, and I feel like they should have the first opportunity to take advantage of it. And I feel like the way that this is listed today, if we're not careful, we could have 20 people who have only worked for the district for seven years get it, and that person that's worked for the district for 32 years get denied. And I don't like that. So how to put it in a perspective, proven. though, like when yeah. I look back at the previous early retirements, we've offered we've offered similar packages, and about 35 to 40 people have been eligible. We rarely see more than 15 yeah. take it. Yep. So when I saw when I heard the 20 cap. To be compliant with the law, I'm like, when's the last time we've had 20 people take early You're retirement? You're not going to get 20 people. Well, once. Right, less than a third is kind of the number. It's about a third, like a about third the last time the take people it. eligible took yeah. it. I mean, and, and on the, go ahead, Frank. Well, I was just going to say, reading through it, one of the ways it's structured to encourage, I think, what you're describing is that if you have six years of service, like you said, or something, the benefit is much lower, right? That it's yeah. saying, Okay, you can take this, but now you're going to be limited in certain ways, and you're not going to get that much out of it. You could, I mean, if you had a proposal to change it, maybe like cut some of these off, or like what would you do differently specifically to make this fit the goal you're describing? My goal is just to offer to the people who have, who have the most years. So of how would you them. change this specifically to get there? Is what I'm asking. I would start out offering it to 20 to 30 years of continuous years of service and see who takes advantage of it, and then right. you cycle it down from there. And that fits what one of my things too is like. I hope people have time to make this decision. The answer is they don't, right? So what we could do is say, well, you offer it to these groups first. Well, we have to meet the 45-day posting. 45 days. And, you get, and we're already... You get some potential age discrimination issues, too. Yes, that's why the HRA thing changed a little bit as well, because what I was originally trying to do is multiply their current age mm -hmm. to the age reaching 65 to provide health insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing, and the attorneys told me, no, I have to do it in a lump sum amount. So then we were trying to navigate what's a fair amount to put it in HRA. And... We could probably cut some of these categories off of eligibility, right? Of years of service. I mean, it sounds like that's what you care about the most, right? Is years of service. I care about just making sure that for people that put the most time in. The what? Time, like time in service or just time on? Unless I misunderstand you. Yeah. So how do we change this to make it more like what you want? You. The more narrow that the uh, package is. The, the your your decrease. I mean, it, it's an option. Yeah, you get to a point just, where you don't you, need you're, you're saying you don't like it this wide. You're going to make it more narrow, and so then if 17 are going to take it now, 15 to 17. If you decrease the eligibility to 30, then you're going to get 10. I mean, it, it, it everything you do is going right. to be a trade off in one. Yeah. You know, it's there's a pro and a con. You know, to all of it. Yeah. That that 100. There's, it, there's, there's a lot of pros and cons of this package. You know, and mm -hmm. I'm just. I'm raising concerns that I've heard, raising concerns that I individually have, and just raising concerns for, the, concerns for the district because we know that there are positions right now we don't have filled. There are subjects that we are struggling to have teachers for right now, and I feel like that, you know, there's just a lot of give and take here, and we have to figure out if it's really the right choice. From a pure budgeting standpoint, yes, it's the right choice, but that's only because we have too much money in one account and not enough in another. And that's Even from a staffing situation, it there are there's a pro I don't think that we've discussed, and that is we have employees out there right now that are considering retirement, regardless of mm -hmm. of the of of whether early retirement would be offered or not. And, and those are in the a ones year that we don't offer it, and those are um, the ones you want to reward. We, we don't we maybe don't get no, that information back until it's, it comes time to sign a contract for the next year. 
And while again, we hope to do that much sooner this year than we have in the past, that could put us where um, we're, we don't, aren't aware of the position that we need to fill until March, April, May. If you're considering retiring, uh, we're gonna know January 12th, which I do think helps, I mean, that helps with the overall staffing picture of right. knowing in January um, if we need to go out uh, and, and look for a specifically, you know, a harder to find well, and uh, it'll help position with, to fill. It'll help with um, knowing for negotiations as well, right? When you when it's time to have negotiations, mm -hmm. we know. The sooner we know these things, this is the better. Yeah, definitely. We can start looking. So if you went 20 years and above, that would go from 41 eligible people to 13 eligible people. Yeah. Just put it into perspective. That's a lot of money. And if they don't take it. Yeah, that really does narrow yeah. down here. The reassuring thing to me, too, is that, that there's only 12 teachers that are uh, eligible for it, and I think we all kind of agree that teachers are some of the hardest positions to find replacements yeah. for. So, to, to, to me, I mean, like, I am worried about the what I think is the kind of the the uh, additional workload consequences um, that are on the part on that, that could follow from this that are, that already follow from our staffing problems but but for me I look at it as the flip side of layoffs in the sense that at the very least this is a way we have money that we could give to people that that might offset layoffs and the layoff doesn't come with retirement right and so I, you know if we can if we can give people money that in, in, a, in a way that um, offsets giving them nothing then we should do it mm -hmm. seems to me so I yeah I feel like that I agree with all those trade-offs when you say like well if you shrink the pool to a smaller amount is it even worth it I feel like yeah it's less worth it but there's still value there um, so I guess my question would be if we cut off these first three buckets and said you had to have 20 years of service or more would you want to vote for that or not? I would be more likely to vote for it. Well, it, we're here now, and we're going to be voting. I'm asking you. <laughs> it's just you and your brain. This is the only way for me to find out. Oh. Probably not. So what else would need to change for you to... The, the, the biggest reason I, I wouldn't vote for it isn't because I don't believe there shouldn't be an early retirement. I just don't believe that management funds should be used for it. So. There's no other option. There's no other option. It's the only thing. It's only, you either have that or you don't do it. Yeah, well, that's... But, but the management fund, I mean, the levying portion is bigger than management fund. Mm -hmm. It has to do with a, a ridiculous mistake that was made three or four years ago about levies. Yep. And that's where we're at today. Mm -hmm. We're paying one of the lowest levy rates in the state, mm -hmm. which is the most ridiculous thing we could be doing. Also, we cut that levy by 60% this year. Yeah, so we could have. This we did recognize, could be bigger. We did recognize the yeah. levy problem, and we did reduce right. it. Right, and we didn't do it. Or we did it. We did, we did reduce but it. But if we if, if, if we kept levying at that rate, what would we be using those funds for? Man, this type of thing. This is mm -hmm. all it could be used for. It can only but be used we, for insurance. But we already, have way too much, we already have way too much money in that account, right? I, I'm and not arguing that. Now. And natural gas. And natural gas. Yes. Don't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a very important thing. <laughs> so why would we, why should we have been loving for more if this is the only thing that we can use that money for? You always want to carry a little bit of a you balance in your management. 900,000 a million, just 2.3 million. million sitting there right now. No, no, no. We, we're carrying too much. Yeah. I'm not going to argue that at all. But you always want to carry some. And like in the financial classes in the, the convention the other day, um, yeah, they were recommending, you know, kind of even set dollar amounts that you can keep in there. And it's always, you know, cash levy versus management. Mm -hmm. And I mean, honestly, like you were saying, the reason it was high is because we were doing it instead of cash levy. Exactly. And it's all about trying to keep that levy at a level. And we can only really turn knobs on like two of them. Mm -hmm. right. General, we can do cash levy or we can do management. And the general public can do a geo bonds, and then that's even more, right. you know, debt service levy. But the, um, the levy rate got so is going to get so low, right? The leverage to get to people that want to approve that was going to be even harder yet, and it mm -hmm. is. That's what's made it hard today. And I think our fixed costs are somewhere around seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, I think I sent that to Dr. Mish for this weekend. I think we're around eight hundred forty-five thousand, eight hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, they have to come out there every year, and we're only levying. I think memory served. I didn't go back and look at this. About four hundred thousand this we're year. We're only levying four hundred thousand yeah. this year. So With we we recognized that it was too high, and we knocked it down oh, to yeah. below what our fixed costs are. Yeah. 
we discussed that last year. Yeah. But to the to the early retirement plan, I really care about your opinions about how to change this and make it better. If your answer is, I'm going to vote against this because I don't like how much is in the management fund, there's nothing we can change in here yeah, to well, address that. Well, there's two things I don't like. First of all, I would like to reward those people that have the most years of service. So we could cut off the groups with yeah. fewer years of service. But like I said... If everyone is stating that you know they don't think that's going to provide enough of a cost savings, my biggest issue is making sure that those people have first first opportunity to take advantage of it. That's my my first issue. The reason I still would have trouble voting for it is is because again that just goes back to questioning the entire system of using management money for this type of thing. But that's a whole other. But effort. that's a state requirement. It's, law, right? it's a state law. So what, what, we what we can use the management money for? What, yeah, what we can <laughs> use it for? Yeah. It's a board decision on how much you tax. But there's but there's a re- there's a reason that people are fighting the schools having the ability to levy that money in the first place. So, so the that's uh, something we can change here. Yeah. So, but we can still control if the money gets used. With for. Mark's concerns, yeah. we we have to okay each of these packages being accepted, right? Yeah. So right now it's just offering the early individual. retirement package, then they file with these exhibits with a resignation and so forth onwards, and I'll bring them back to you guys on. January 15th, whatever that Monday meeting is, and you have to approve each one of those resignations, and plus the, early retirement incentive, just like a normal Senate agenda item. So to your point, the if we get 22 people and we can only accept 20, can we just sort by years of experience and instead of first come, first serve, cut off by years experience, or is that a discrimination type thing? I would get into discrimination at that point. That's that's kind of my fear. Yeah, I would be reluctant too to tell somebody here are the rules, right. you're eligible, and then say uh, we, we pulled yours back. Yeah. Um, right. What I will say is we. Throw but we will be that for first come first serve people too. Like here's the rules. Oh, you're the twenty first. Sorry, you don't get. Right. Yeah. A lot of the things you have asked are things we asked mm-hmm. Catherine when we were drafting this. Can we do this? What about this? How do we do this? What, what do they want to see this? Yeah. This is pretty much what we came up with of what's legal and compliant with Frank touching on the thing that is controllable, the tiers of the system, tiers of service. Like I said, we already went through a work session with this. You guys already knew where I stood on it. It's not that I don't agree with early retirement. It's that I just question the way that's being used and the way it's being presented, you know. And I have a lot of concerns about the management fund, how that's been managed the last several years. And I just believe that that needs drawing attention to. So. And, I, and, and Mark, I would totally, I think one of the, I'm really glad, even though, you know, I ultimately support this, what I think is super important, I'm really glad that you're raising it, is, is that more people, especially people from both sides, from all sides of the aisle, all political perspectives, need to understand how, how the state has structured the way that money works. And I think that if we all got together, even despite our differences, political differences, we might all realize that it's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> and that it needs to get fixed. Um, but we can't do that unless people know that it's messed up. And so having this conversation, I think, is absolutely Well, important. the reason we have this opportunity is because we have way too much money in our management fund and not nearly enough in our general fund. And we can only pay our educators out of the general fund. I, and I have a problem with that. And the, that's, but we can't again, increase state our general law. Fund through right. state. It, it's all right. state Can we keep the focus on our educators, our students, our district? Like, I, I like the idea of sending a message to Des Moines, et cetera, but... <laughs> let's tr- let's try to make a decision about this that yep. is focused on our teachers who have been serving here, working here, and teaching our students here, and uh, all the support staffs that have been helping do the same. Yeah, to me, this is, you know, regardless of how we got to this management fund uh, balance, we have a management fund balance. Uh, we can use that to reward our teachers that are near retirement age. Um, and it's one of the levers we can pull to be fiscally responsible while spending more money on teachers and giving them bonuses, which I think is awesome. I wish all of our cost-cutting measures were things that could go towards paying teachers. One thing I don't think we've mentioned yet, but has come up in the past when we talked about early retirement plan is, as a long-term district sort of reputation, it benefits us to be able to say, hey, periodically we offer this to, you know, staff and it's a, a benefit that's not guaranteed but comes around. <coughs> and it's very common in, in districts to offer early retirement. I mean, yeah. it's this is not anything atypical. And I'll be honest with you, the first time I ever was presented one, I was like, no, we're not going to offer something like that. It's not right. But you step back and you look at it and what's right for our people 
is to do something like this. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into the formula, the funds and all that, that's the one fund we can control. And you want to have money there. Trust me. We needed that money there earlier this year, right? So you've got to have it available to use. I think what you're saying is the consistency with offering it every three or four years is actually a retention tool. So yes. that there would yes, if, it is. if you're starting to consider right now and you're like, well, oh, this might be the only time it's ever offered or the district only offers it every 10 years, I better take it now or I won't get the opportunity yeah. again. But we have consistently every three to four years offered, you know, a similar a similar package to this, so Can I it, it might hold you off until the next round. Somewhat of a recruiting tool. I mean, I realize new staff members aren't always thinking about with their retirement decades down the line, but I feel like it's a it's a positive culture benefit, and that's important for recruiting too. Mm -hmm. All right, can we call a vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. All right, motion carries. All right, can I get a motion to approve the revised bid from Shouse Voorhees Contracting for $571,639 for the construction of the concession stand at the baseball softball complex to be paid out of PEPL or SAVE funds? So moved. Second. And discussion. This is over what we were hoping to spend, right? Yeah. <laughs> Way over. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, I, this is, you know... Uh, not to rehash a lot of old conversations, but definitely been something that's been in front of the board for a considerable amount of time. Um, we've been without that concession, without a concession stand or restrooms at the baseball softball field um, for, se for several years. Um, I know there was a question that came today, and, and you know, Josh is here to help answer questions too. But there were five um, bids submitted. Uh, this was the lowest bid. Um, and the most flexibility to work through those cha that change order process to come down underneath our, you know, our max budget. Um, this is substantially higher than I think um, FEH anticipated, um, than, than we anticipated. However, if we hold off, um, the risk would be that that cost continues. Um, I think that we've already gotten the feedback that if we were to go to rebid, that this lowest bid would already be higher. So the costs continue to rise, um, and we continue to need a solution to porta potties at our softball and baseball field in June and July when it's 95 degrees. And we haven't had a concession stand for three years, four years. Since so, if I, if I remember correctly, what um, Mr. Allison said, if there were the kids who are seniors this year have never, who will be playing senior ball, have never had a uh, concession stand or port or regular bathroom at that field when they've played there. So if we approve this, uh, when's the break ground date? Josh, do you, when will they start? Well, I think the quicker we can get it approved, obviously, the quicker they can break ground, but it's, it's going to depend on weather right now because concrete is starting to get cold. I think... If we, I, there's a possibility looking at long term that if we get it approved right away, they could go straight into construction and grading off and setting up forms. But there's no guarantee. It's strictly weather at this point. I mean, have they said that if weather holds for another month that they can start in the next month? Or I think they're itching to get going. Okay. It's just waiting on us to approve it so we can let them know it's approved. We're ready to go. How fast can you get stuff moved in to get rolling? Um, so I have actually done reached out to a few people that are involved with this today because uh, one of the new board members called me last night and told me the price and I, my initial reaction was well that includes the, the batting cages so it's fine but no it does not include the it's batting not. cages I did that research this morning which we have so, those prices for the batting cages the addition was about, about two hundred ninety thousand on top of that right um, this particular bid was two ninety yeah. but they ranged from up to 326 for the um, for the additional structure mm -hmm. for the batting cage addition. So right now we only had what six hundred thousand dollars earmarked for this project. And he just walked out. I want to say it was it it was less than six hundred. So it was that five eighty five eighty five. Yeah, and I think it's five eighty nine out of yeah. I mean it was a it was a collaboration to get it to where 
And it I, was under our max budget. I know that originally we, we had earmarked this money. The hope was is that this could potentially uh, allow for the concession stand at the football field and this, but obviously the football field is not going to happen. How long do we think that will be put off once we approve this? That I'm not sure on. I do know that with regulations as far as bathrooms, that's the big holdup mm -hmm. for the football side because it goes off of seating capacity. There's a lot of seating capacity. We'd have to have, I think it was 23 bathrooms on the visitor side alone wow. um, because of seating capacity. That's crazy. I think it was, think it was 13 crazy. women and 12 men. Now, why is that with new construction? Because you know there's all types of old stadiums that have this dramatic cool. grandfather, 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 basically, grandfather. Yeah. is what it amounts to. So with new regulations and stuff, you have to have so many bathrooms for the seating that you have. Mm -hmm. Um, one way to possibly work around that would be maybe take out some of that seating. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole other issue that we'd have to resolve. So, But the thing is, if we did that at the ball field, I mean, we're still talking minimal savings, aren't we? I mean, with the stalls that are currently present there. Yeah. At this point, I think we're better off to actually get the facility up and going, actually give the kids a good facility this year. Uh, for the, yeah, at the baseball itself, I, I agree 100%. They, would it be done for something. this year? According to their schedule, it would be done before, well, I think, what they say, the end of May, middle of, first to middle of May is what they're projecting. But that all weather. depends on weather. Weather. That's, that's our biggest concrete. hold up right now. Mm -hmm. Oops, your things are running short. It's just so much money. It um, is. I agree. It's ridiculous. I guess one less, don't turn tear down what you got until you know what it's going to cost to replace it. Mm -hmm. Well. And this will exhaust Always our pebble funds inside, for the right? year. Yep. So. What'd you say, Adam? And this but, will pass um, out our pebble funds for the year. I can't remember if I touched on this, but adding on the batting cage later will be completely doable if we decide to do that at a later date. Correct? Yes, so it's whatever. designed yep, to do that. The exact, I mean, or it was designed in such a way that it could be done as an addition later. Because that was something that we were really hoping Without for. Without disrupting the building there, I mean, there wouldn't be a, a cost, in, an extra cost to disassemble part of the building to add on yeah. so it's just another structure that will be tied into it and really most of the cost is going to be in the bathrooms <coughs> and the concession the building doesn't matter right, right. Part, that's what you're going to get so. yeah when you look at it too you can see kind of where the cost savings are like oh, we'll be insulating this part and yeah. Yeah. they're trying they're trying you yeah. know we exchange exchange several emails back and forth to revamp some things i talked to the contractor today that put it in together or whatever and i mean he said that this is the best they can do and that was dramatically less than the comp competing bids so it was so. i know tyler was surprised yeah so, I'm surprised it was the high or surprised that the high they were done. that would cost. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Josh. All right, can I get a motion to approve the board policies of the second reading 102.e2 continuous notice of non discrimination? 102.E3, Section 504, Student and Parental Rights. 102.E4, Discrimination Complaint Form. 200.2, Powers of the Board of Directors. 200.3, Responsibilities of the Board of Directors. 202.3, Terms of Office. 202.4, Vacancies. 300, Role of School District Administration. 301.1, Administration. 301.2, Administrative Team. 301.3, Administrative Structure. 302.3, Superintendent Salary and Other Compensation. 302.4, Superintendent Duties. 305, Administrator Code of Ethics. 402.1, Release of Credit Information. 603.11, Citizenship. 604.8, Foreign Citizens. 606.4, Student produ Production of Materials and Services. 606.9, Credit Recovery for Students in Grades 9 through 12. 705.2, Credit and Procurement Card. 705.03, Payment for Goods and Services. 705.4, Expenditures for a Public Purpose. 705.1, R1, Purchasing, Bidding, Suspension, and disbar no, Debarment of Vendors and Contractors Procedure. 
705.6, purchasing on behalf of employees. 706.1, payroll period. 707.1, secretary's reports. 705.05, receiving supplies and equipment. 707.5R1, internal controls procedures. And that's it. So moved. A second. And discussion? I'm glad I got to hear you say that one last time, Christy. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve the abstract of votes presented? So moved. Second. And discussion. I'm excited. Excited for the new board members. Yeah, this is what we have to go through every election. We have to approve the, the canvas. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. So I go to the adjournment and resolution of retirement. Mm-hmm. Yep. So can I get... Well, there's no motion. It's just the adjournment and resolution of retiring school okay. board members. Um, yeah. So following the reading of a resolution, the retiring board will adjourn and new board members will join the board um, at board seats, at the board seats, whereas public schools are being held to higher standards of accountability than ever before at both state and federal levels, and whereas school boards work diligently to ensure our young people are educated and prepared for college, careers, and citizenship, and whereas the men and women elected to, to school board positions deserve recognition and thanks for their countless hours of volunteer service to publication, to public education, and whereas Christy Welsh, Margot Von Strohuber, John McCurley, Timothy Bauer, and Frank Bros have faithfully served the students and citizens of the Fairfield Community School District, be it therefore resolved that the residents of the Fairfield Community School District acknowledge the contributions made by these board members and declare their appreciation and gratitude for such service. Um, and we would close with um, any uh, uh, retiring or you know, uh, outgoing board members, if you'd like to share highlights from tonight or from your service um, on the Fairfield Community School District um, board, uh, and and for your and thankful for your years of service. I have something I'd like to read that I wrote. Um, reflecting on the past six years of serving on the Fairfield Community School Board of Directors, I am filled with gratitude, fulfillment, and a touch of nostalgia. When I first embarked on this journey, I had little understanding of the depth of involvement and the immense learning curve that awaited me. The challenges were plentiful, but so were the rewards. The countless hours of volunteer work and continuous learning that not only enriched my personal and professional life, but have also allowed me to contribute to our community in meaningful ways. However, life sometimes takes unexpected turns, and I have made the difficult decision to not seek re-election due to the health challenges faced by a family member who undoubtedly will demand my time and attention. It has been an honor to serve as your board president for the past three years, and I am sincerely grateful for the trust and confidence that my fellow board members have placed in my leadership. The collaborative spirit within our board has been a cornerstone of our success. We may not always have, been, have seen eye to eye, but our ability to maintain respect and uphold ethical standards has been a source of pride for me. As I step away from this role, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to each of you for your dedication, cooperation, and support. Working alongside such capable and committed group has been a privilege, and I will undoubtedly miss the challenges <laughs> the triumphs that defined our shared experience. To the incoming board members, I offer my best wishes. You are about to embark on your journey that will undoubtedly present its own set of challenges. However, I am confident that you will successfully navigate these challenges with your dedication and commitment to work together. May you find the same sense of fulfillment and camaraderie that I have experienced during my tenure. Thank you all for the opportunity to serve. And I look forward to watching the continued success and growth of the Fairfield Community School District under the guidance of the incoming board. Thanks, Christy. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, Christy. Thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say thank you. Um, I've been called by a number of board members and superintendents across the state um, 15 years 
sitting at a board table of one form or another. And one of the superintendents that I've known for many years said, you don't want to count the hours because it's thousands of hours <laughs> that you've spent uh, over the last. And he goes, you won't know what to do with the uh, two Monday nights a month you have back in your schedule. Um, it's been very rewarding. Uh, education is a key to the cornerstone of all of our students. It's always been about the kids for me. It wasn't political, and I'll always say that. The political part is what gets us in trouble, and that's what the problem's been, and it will be. So, um, and I still will be, I've been, I will still be on the Iowa Board of Education Examiners for at least four more years, if not eight. Um, so I must still be very involved at the, the education level at that point, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'm excited for the future that has we have here not only locally in this district, which is the one that put me where I'm at today, but where we got to go in the future. So I'm looking forward to it. Best of luck to all of you. You're going to have some very difficult decisions. The last four years have been the most difficult time on a board that I've been on because we started out with COVID and we did a little bit of everything. So um, very challenging, and it's gotten to be a very complex web that we've got to get through and move forward. So I'm looking forward to seeing the progress, and good luck to all of you. Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Tim. Thanks for all the guidance. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll say something. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that, that uh, in one form or another, I've been involved in schools, not counting the hours that I spent actually myself learning things, uh, from owning a Montessori preschool for five years when my kids were two and four years old, and then going back to college. Um, well, the sale of that school allowed me to go back to college. And uh, teaching English in California for 20 years, and then moving to Fairfield, and going back to school yet one more year in order to get my license in uh, special education and teaching here for 19 years, and then being on the board for four years. In one way or another, I've just been involved in all of it. Uh, and it makes me full. It just makes me full. I hope those of you who are going to be coming on the board have the same experience that that I have had on this board. We have had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful four years. I, I can't say enough about my time here. I don't say much, but I listen a lot. And, um, and believe me, it's all still there, and it will be for a long time. And I thank you all. I really thank every single one of you for everything, especially one person whose name I will not mention right now. But it's, you know, so he is. So thank, thank you, Margo. Thanks, Margo. Thanks. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Your turn. Um, I have. Yeah, I would like to thank all the board members uh, that I've served with, past and present. You know, it's, um, uh, I think that these institutions are some of the closest things that we can get to democracy, and that matters a lot to me. You know, that we come together, as a, especially in a small community like this, where we, again, where we like almost real democracy can, the closest that we can get to it can happen. And here we get an opportunity to not only practice that, but to practice it with regard to the, the second most important thing, uh, or perhaps the actually truly most important thing, which is the education of our children. 
collectively, right? Yeah. It's the thing that we can all, we all should be able to unite around. And so when those two things are combined, you know, it's a pretty, it can be, it should be a pretty magical thing. And, um, you know, and it, and, it's, and, it, and it is also rightfully a thing that, you know, people get, get argue about, right? Um, both those things. Um, but like I, as everyone has said, you know, one of the things that I think has been most remarkable about my experience is, again, the way that, that um, for all the challenges that we've had, and you know, they again range from things like the world historical, um, uh, hopefully only once in a century pandemic, um, to all the other challenges um, that, uh, you know, that we have done a pretty good job of working through the messy nature of democracy, especially when it comes to something as important as public education. So, yeah. so you know, again, I just would like to thank all of you for, for being able to learn from you. You know, there's a lot of you that I've learned a lot from, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, as well as your camaraderie and, you know, and every once in a while we have fun, um, <laughs> all things considered. That's the truth. Um, so again, uh, just, you know, thank, thank you all. And, and to those of you who are coming, you know, again, it's a, it's a hell of a job and um, uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks, John. I could sneak in, even though I'm just ending a short appointment, it'd be the same feeling that I had from before, which is, you know, even now, even just this little stint, I've met new people that I never would have met. I've gotten to know people mm -hmm. that I haven't known in decades, you know. And to me, that's, it's not only just the most valuable thing personally to take away from this, that I would recommend all of you grab a hold of as much as you can, but... It also gives me so much confidence in our district because these people, everybody that I've met in the school buildings, and that includes students and volunteers and teachers and support staff, they're, they're all so great. And so we have all the ingredients here to do whatever we want, and it, it gives me so much confidence, the people I've met, and every problem that I thought was going to be simple wasn't simple, but there were people who really cared who were working on it and they didn't always agree with each other I didn't always ag agree with with everything but the people care and they're working really hard and that gives me so much confidence it should should give us all a lot of confidence um, so that that's my advice just get to know some people and appreciate them for who they are because there's there's so much to appreciate <clears throat> All right, I think we'll take a five minute break before everything else happens, right? I'm going to sign these.
for a second. Megan Dowd Robbins? Here. Dave Eastburn? Here. Chris, Christy Kessel? Here. Mark Porter? Here. Mark Thornton? Here. Ty? Here. Deborah Williamson? Here. Um, and then we are going to do the oath of office for the new board members. So as you want to enable, please raise your hand and I will say the oath of office. Just wait till I'm and just answer by saying yes and then take your seat at the board table. Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Iowa and that you will faithfully and impartially to the best of your ability discharge the duties of the office of school board member in the Fairfield Community School District as now and hereafter required by law? Yes. Please take your seats. <clears throat> We go ahead and move uh, on. <laughs> yes, I will get her for chair. I'll move over. Welcome, for everybody. <laughs> um, you can use my packet. Oh, okay. Oh, so I got a more formal up here. <laughs> That's right. How great did you get? Uh, it shows up to the office like that all the time. I know. <laughs> There was a time when we were supposed to wear a suit for important things. So. <laughs> Just my uniform. No, Is it everyone comfortable forward. and ready to keep moving forward? Okay. All right, so the next item of business is public participation. I did see that we received one form. So on behalf of the fellow board members, at this time, <coughs> I would like to invite any member of the audience that has filled out the form to step up to the microphone with comments about items of interest or concern. Although we meet in public, we do not meet with the public, and as such, the board cannot comment or answer questions. Please begin by stating your name and relationship to the school. It would be appreciated if you would limit your comments to five minutes. If 10 or more forms are submitted, we will reduce the time limit to three minutes per person. We ask that you remember that Iowa law prohibits us from discussing specific <coughs> employees or their job performance. And Dr. Mishra, we have one public yeah, comment, correct? So we do, from Mashari. Is there another one? That was a crumple from the homeschool oh, public hearing. Okay. They just okay. thought they had to fill it out. Gotcha. Gotcha. My name is Michelle Elnuri. I work at the high school as the, I think we're calling it applied science now, um, for his industrial arts in the New York Polytech. Uh, this is my third year in the district. Uh, and one of the things that was discussed when I first joined as a technology teacher was the uh, fact that I would be doing coding as a class um, for temporarily for, this, for the state because they require that at least one computer science class is taught for credit and so on. Um, and so I'm supplementing that. But the issue is that why haven't we been pursuing a computer science teacher? And maybe we have, but I mean consistently and continually. Like, I don't believe that the offer has been out every year to find a computer science teacher. And feel free to let me know in history if I'm wrong, but in today's issues, one of the biggest, well, <laughs> biggest thing in the news now is AI and other bits of software that are impacting major parts of our society. Um, just having the National Guard in the school and talking with them, they just have a new field of occupation, which is cyber warfare. Um, we're talking also cybersecurity, but that's been around for a while. You're hearing more and more about businesses and so on having cyber attacks, yet this is not something we pursue at our school, maybe not in many other schools as well, but it's not being pursued at our school seriously. I, wor I work with students that are into coding, and I do offer them that taste of coding, um, but I do not get into Python or C++ because these are languages. As a technology teacher, to just better define that is I work with the physical world, that's my specialty. Don't get me wrong, I love working with these kids. They're doing great, they have wonderful ideas, but I cannot feed that appetite of the more they want to do, the better they want to do. I have a student that already wants to go into cybersecurity, but I cannot help them get there. Um, this is not a cry that you know we have to dish out a ton of money to try to get a computer science here, but to seriously try to have a curriculum for computer science to just allow them that that breath of fresh air, that ability to just express themselves. Um, I've seen, like I said before, I've seen the appetite 
uh, and it would be nice to have it here. And the nice thing about computer science is, is that when you get occupations, you don't have to travel all the time. You know, maybe that might be a good look at how we can do more business in town and maybe have the tiny itty bitty Silicon Corn Valley. Uh, but the point is though, is that it's, it's here and it's, it's a major topic now. And it would be nice to see that the board and push and to see a position filled for that. I don't think that everybody out there is looking for the money. They come to teach because they want to teach and maybe we can find that person still, but it just, I feel like it really needs to be a continuing process to push and find that person. That's all I really had to say about that. Nice to see the new board. Have yourselves a great term and see you around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, next item of business is going to be to the election of president. So kind of how this works, this first step is nominations. This is not a discussion. If you have anyone you want to nominate, you throw the names out there. After that, there will be to approve blank if there's multiple. We'll get a motion a second on that, and then we'll go into discussion, and then we'll take a roll call vote if there's multiple. If there's only one, we'll just call it to vote after discussion. So first things first, is there any nominations for president? I move to nominate Ty Ward as school board president for the 23-24 school year. Second. It's not a motion. A second is just nominations, throwing names out for now. Right. So is there any other names we would like to... See no more nominations. Do I have a motion to approve Ty Ward as school board president for the 23-24 school year? So moved. Is there a second? Second. And any discussion? Yeah. Hearing none. Thanks, <laughs> hearing none, seeing none. Let's go ahead and call it to vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Motion passes, 7-0. Congratulations, Ty Ward. I have to swear you in as president, and then you get this cool little gavel. Sweet. Uh, um, it with an iron so if will and enable, please stand and raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Iowa, and that you will faithfully and impartially, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties of the Office of School Board President in the Fairfield Community School District, as now and here and after required by law? I will. Congratulations. Will I move up there now? Yes, you do. <laughs> Can we all shift down one? <laughs> I appreciate the trust you guys showing me, and I will try not to screw it up. Don't embarrass the family. <laughs> <laughs> Next order of business, take nominations for the uh, school board vice president. I nominate Mark Porter. Any other nominations? Seeing none, <clears throat> motion to approve Mark Porter as school board vice president for the 2023-2024 school year. I move, approve. So Do I hear a second? Second. All right, any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> all opposed? Motion carries. All right. What's that? Can you do nothing, or am I good? Yes, you do. Oh, I'm sorry, you as well. <laughs> well, today, if we stand and raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and that you will faithfully and impartially, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties of the Office of Vice President of School Board in the Fairfield Community School District, as now hereafter required by law? I will. Congrats. All right. Congrats, Mark. Thank you. Uh, next order of business, to approve the first and third Mondays of each month at 6.30 p.m. for the work session and regular board meeting of the board of directors to be held at the ACT boardroom. I move approval. Second. All right, discussion. One, one thing I'll stay on this is that this moves a lot, right? Um, one thing I think that we did to this is because a couple years ago, we were actually doing this the third and fourth Monday of the month, I believe it was. And it seemed like we just had massive amounts of school board activities for a couple weeks, and then we'd have none for long periods of time. So I do think I was one of the people that requested that we spread this out so we could get it a little bit more averaged out. I think it started, I, I feel like it started working better for people's schedules by doing it the first and third Monday. I don't know what other people think, but. I agree. It, I think it was a good move. It didn't really keep us quite so disconnected with stuff for a couple weeks at a time. You know, it did overwhelm us for the other two weeks essentially and then for those of us that have sporadic work schedules they become way too much at certain weeks you know so so if anyone else wants to move it or has a yeah. complication with us now's the time to tell us because i also think the first and the third works well because city council meets on the second and fourth mondays <clears throat> yeah we used to conflict with that i think and then we moved to first and third to not conflict with that All right, any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. All right, recommendation to approve the election of the IASB delegate. So moved. Do we got a second? Second. All right, who is it? So, yeah, I was about to say there's now a motion second on the table, so technically this one would have to fail because we haven't nominated, nominated or delegated anyone. Oh, do we got this So one? if you guys say yes, we just approved no one. Um, so if you guys all say no, <laughs> we can nominate and then move to approve blank as, we should just put a blank in there for you guys, so I apologize on that. So we need to vote for it and vote no. So who was it? It was Tim Bauer. Okay. And so every district needs to have one delegate. Yeah, but I believe there's something at the convention that they have to go represent. And... Ty, Ty did it for us. Yeah, so here. I did it at the, uh, <clears throat> at the convention. I don't know, is it usually president, vice president, or is it usually it's someone anyone else? Anyone at the yeah, board yeah, is willing. Anybody who wants to okay. do that role. So your duties would consist just of going to the one November... Meeting. So we meeting. do work through um, legislative priorities. That's happened typically in a work session. Um, in the past where um, IASB provides us the like a comprehensive list that that our local school board um, establishes what their priorities are and then you can take that um, to the to the delegate assembly as well and then I don't know what that experience was like um, you know if there were <clears throat> how, how that information was gathered we probably submit that to IASB somehow um, again I think that was happening behind the scenes with Tim doing some of them. Yeah, I, I mean, my experience the other day at the convention was just that, uh, you know, I think it was probably the culmination of a year's worth of work, and then there was 29, 26 different recommendations, um, mainly about just kind of what our legislative goals would be, um, what the kind of we're looking to lobby for, um, what kind of, you know, the Iowa State, uh, you know, school board association was going to stand for in the next, uh, you know, in the next legislative session, and hopefully get some wins this year. I think anyone can do that. I think the biggest thing is, is just uh, it's an opportunity for someone to really go up there and help speak their mind and help have an influence, you know, and that's something that we really need to start doing a better job of is getting more involved at the state level because <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we can have an effect on that, you know, we're probably not speaking loud enough on right now, so. Yeah, rural voices get drowned out a lot by city voices, so yes. for sure. What is the time commitment uh, for the delegate? I would say it's not really outside of any other 
events that you would already be at between the work sessions or regular meetings, maybe an hour here or there on the side to submit some hours to ISB or to submit the legislative priorities. Um, <coughs> other than that, I would not say it's a huge lift and a lot of it's done right at the board table <coughs> with all school board members. It's just, it's kind of like having a president. You just have to have a single voice for a school board too. If, if no one else wants to do it, I'm more than willing to do it. I have sp spoken to the Iowa School Board Association out there and been, you spoke in my willingness to do whatever I need to do to help them with some things. So I would be happy to do it if you guys, if, if, you, if the new board members aren't comfortable doing it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But it's, there's not much of a commitment there. So you, you either have a choice to start getting involved now or not. So um, can we it really doesn't matter. Go ahead and fail this initial motion and then sure. back to discussion for the nomination. We could also have a motion to uh, amend it, right? right. Put a name in that. Yeah. All right. So... Uh, we're going to vote on this one, and uh, and this is the uh, motion with no name in there. So hopefully it doesn't have a lot of support. Uh, <laughs> all in favor of this motion, say aye. Aye. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> all opposed. Where is the one together? See, Tim is the one that guided us through all this stuff. <laughs> all right. They are. Right. Yeah. You guys, you guys want to nominate Mark? Porter, <coughs> do I hear a nomination for him? I'll nominate, nominate Mark. Perfect. Anybody else want to do it? I'm interested. I'm not sure I have enough information. So is there a travel involved or is it all done from Fairfield? So there's basically just one big meeting. Yeah. And that was at the IAS. And that's that was at the convention IAS conference. So mm -hmm. that um, morning when you guys were going to probably ready set govern was her first one. We went to finance. Oh, finance. No, when we you guys went, went to, to finance, finance, that first one I went to the delegate meeting. Okay, I've been a delegate before. Um, I would be interested in doing this, and um, yeah, I think I have the time. Sure. Do I hear a nomination for Deborah Williamson? She can nominate herself. All right, well. perfect. She's yeah. nominating uh -huh. herself. Good. <laughs> so now says we have two, it's by roll call. All right. It's up to you. Oh, okay. You want her representing so. or if you want me to represent. <laughs> so I'll side day. a motion a second to approve the no. reporter or Deborah Williamson as the election or as ISB delegate. You get the motion a second, then you do a roll call vote, which I'll do. And then everyone says so which one they're voting for. They okay. For. All right, so the motion is to approve the election of Mark Porter or Deborah Williamson of, to, the, I, to the IASB delegate. We need a motion to second to start that. So moved. Do I hear a second? second? All right. And the roll call vote. Any other discussion? Oh, any, any other discussion about it? Either of you guys will be great. <laughs> All right. Roll call vote. Dave Eastburn. Uh, Mark Porter. Megan Dodd Robbins. Mark Porter. Christy Kessel. Mark Porter. Mark Porter. Mark Porter, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Thornton. Mark Porter. Tyler Ward. Deborah Williamson. Deborah Williamson. Deborah Williamson. <laughs> So. All right, Mark Porter, you're now our delegate to the, the IASB. Thank you. Thank you both for volunteering to do that. All right, now we're going to take nominations for the Fairfield Education Foundation Board representative. Um, I've been on that board before. Um, the school board uh, representation is very, very valuable to it, and it's great. So it's a, it's a fun one too. I, point of order, Mr. Chair. I, my wife Vicky's on the board, so maybe I should abstain. You definitely for should. For a conflict. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is actually on that board also. <laughs> I think my wife just came off the board. But. <laughs> So you can abstain from being nominated, and it's your choice to abstain from the vote or yes. not. So I abstain from being nominated, and I will abstain from the vote. Does anybody else want to try doing it? The time commitment on this one is um, typically the first uh, Wednesday of the month right now. Um, and 
the way it has gone, I'm assuming is the way it's traditionally been as well. Um, we provide, um, I'm also a ex officio board member, um, and so we provide updates. Um, so I provide updates for the district and the board representative has been a, a providing updates for the um, board. We also have a student representative. Um, I don't know, I would say they typically last an hour to maybe 90 minutes um, on that first Wednesday uh, of the month. Um, we've met here or at Agra. And if you're not familiar with that board, they, uh, they, they have an endowment or a foundation where they give uh, grants to teachers um, for uh, classroom supplies. Um, and they also give away several scholarships, uh, four-year scholarships. And uh, yeah, it's all about giving away some money to uh, students and teachers. So it's really, it's pretty fulfilling. Fun, yeah. yeah. So we have to ask, for, we have to wait for someone to offer? Or to yeah, does, does, someone? does anybody want to nominate or does anyone want to volunteer themselves in order to I'm do I'm able this? to nominate Megan Dowd for Robbins. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to do it? All right. Hearing none, the motion to approve the election of Megan Dowd Robbins to Fairfield Education Foundation Board Representative. Motion and second. Any other discussion? You'll do great, Megan. <laughs> All right, hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries. Any abstains? I abstain. And two abstains. <clears throat> so motion passes. Motion five passes zero five to zero. <clears throat> Some more abstains than we've had all year. <laughs> <laughs> I respect you guys for doing that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Next recommendation. To approve the school budget review committee request for open enrollment out not on prior year's headcount in the amount of three hundred and thirteen thousand nine hundred and forty dollars. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. Can you kind of fill us in on this yeah. stuff? <laughs> Why would yeah, so um, I don't know what you got. It was an ISB, obviously has qualifications, so I apologize if you guys already learned this in Finance 101. So schools operate off of what's called spending authority. Spending authority is kind of like a credit card. You get a credit limit. This request is asking for more credit limit because our open enrollment out last year exceeded well, what it says there, prior year's head count, so we weren't able to count those. But for every kid that open, it, open enrolls out, I still have to pay the bill to the neighboring district if they are a resident kid. So therefore, this request allows me to go before the school budget review committee, which is appointed by Kim Reynolds every year to ask for additional authority for those incurred costs. Um, you can always say no if you do not. If you do say no, it impacts our UAB, our unspent authorized budget, which is currently sitting around 20% and projected to go down a little bit. Um, so that is a right you have, but either way, I have to pay this bill to the neighboring district. So I'm just asking permission to go before the school budget review committee to get additional authority to protect our UAB. Now, with that being said, this is not additional money, it's authority, not cash. So does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. And this is something and, we do every year. Yeah, I was this is a common, this will be here every year. Um, so every year, we go before the school budget review committee for um, these modified supplemental amounts for open enrollment. ELL is another big one. Um, it's kind of like special education deficit. We can never predict how much our English language learners will need on any given year. Um, sometimes we can't get them out of the programs or up to speed to participate in class within the state guidelines of five years. So if we have to keep them additional services beyond those five years as well, I mean, that's for additional authority. Can we do this with special ed? Um, special ed every year during the special education supplement. So September 15th, after I certify certified annual report, um, we will have our special education deficit of this year's $1.4 million I stood before the board for, for the additional authority, and those were granted um, to allow us to use our cash reserve levy to pay off those expenses. Um, there's a couple other odds, odds and ends out there. Um, sometimes they come up, but these three are the most common ones. This is, obviously this number is calculated somehow, right? <coughs> 
Yeah, it's a uh, so um, I could pull it up, but it's based on the, the dollar cost per pupil. So you took the number of kids that we weren't able to count times that. So if I took 313,940 divided by 7,635, you'd come up with the number sure. that was on that. But this was pre computed by the state of Iowa, so. I move approval. All right. We already had a motion a second on the table. We're under discussion, yep. so. All right, no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. All right, next on the docket, recommendation to approve the school budget review committee request for English language instruction beyond five years in the amount of $19,240. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Kind of the same thing, right? It's the same as last time. This is for the English language instruction. Sorry, I said learners instruction. To change the verbiage every year. Sometimes it's ESL, sometimes it's EOL. I guess this year it's EL. <coughs> Schools love a good acronym. Yes, I get confused all the time. <laughs> you guys will be learning a lot of new acronyms. All right, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Recommendation to approve the MOA between Community Child Care Center and FCSD to provide statewide voluntary preschool programming. So moved. Second. Mark seconded. All right, and discussion. So this is a routine um, agreement. Um, MOA stands for Memorandum of Agreement. You might also see these um, over time um, with the acronym again, or the um, abbreviation MOU, Mem Memorandum of Understanding. Um, this is, uh, so Community Child Care also offers the statewide voluntary preschool programming for four-year-olds. Um, we count those students on our enrollment and then serve as a flow through uh, for, for community child care. So routine, um, approval. I do have a typo that I was alerted to on page 183 in the packet. And so, Evan, to change a four to a three, what do we uh, need to do? So I have 2024 um, slash 2024 in the actual funding under um, 10A, and that needs to read 2023. So we can go, so does everyone have it in front of them? So we all do. So you can go approve the MOA between the Community Child Care Center and FCSD to provide statewide voluntary preschool programming as presented. So you're presenting the correct one, I assume, is in front of them right now. So we add the as presented to it. It'll be approved. So the correct one is here. They're looking at what's in the Oh, they're looking the at packet. what's in there um, as amended. Okay. I think there's also on the previous page one e two. There was, I know there was two that I changed. I, so yeah, under I, term. I assume you can't go from July to going 2024 to June 2024? Correct. <laughs> and I'm, I've got too many papers in my Not pack. yet. <laughs> to page 182. Under the term, term. July 23. And that is accurate here. And the one that we, um, and the one that we signed. So we can take a motion to amend those two numbers. A motion. Second. All right. So any more discussion about the amendment? We'll vote on the amendment first, and then we'll vote on the uh, as amended. Uh, so all in favor of the amendment to change those two dates from 2024 to 2023, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion carries. All right. Any further discussion on the uh, the I just parent have a motion? Questions. Um, is this have you been partnering in this way and on, on an ongoing basis? Correct. Okay. And it's because we can't meet the enrollment for four-year-old preschool elsewhere. It it, it provides choice. Okay. Um, so I I can't speak to how long community child care is offered. Um, preschool. That's not. Um, maybe maybe you all would have a better idea on. The length of time they've offered and the um 
I, I don't know, but I have another question, I guess. Um, the teacher there, do they get a lot, like all the resources and, and, I mean, I know it was kind of discussed here, but my only concern would just be making sure that the teacher is supported in the full, to the full extent. Yep, so they use um, the creative curriculum that our preschool uses as well. Um, when our preschool, um, so our preschool is in with kindergarten and first grade um, at Washington, and they transitioned to um, a new reading resource um, this year, and we reached out to child care or community child care to say, you know, this is, the district's moving in this direction where we have this additional resource. Are you interested? Um, they declined that at that point, um, but there is that, you know, so if something like that were to come up, that's just an example of that uh, communication that goes back and forth. Okay. And this program is a little different because we're like a flow through for yeah. the program. So they get their per people, but we certify and get the funding for them. And we just send them the money to use as they see fit. Another example you'll see this on is like the Maharishi University. It's title funding through us. So I do all the fiscal management on that title programming. But they have the choice of what they spend their $10,000, $15,000 on. So it just flows through us based on the state programming. And do they carry the insurance? So a lot of that stuff, it's, since it's state mandated, falls under the school's insurance program. Okay. Um, so we do have opportunities, and some of them will be in upcoming work sessions, not to get too in the weeds, to charge in direct cost rates and direct cost rates and all this other stuff to pay for the district's cost to administer these different programs. Um, essentially compensates my time, the superintendent's time other people's time but um the, so since the state says we have to be the flow through we have to carry the insurance okay is that in the contract or the, this memo? i don't think that it alludes to the um insurance in this this okay. is outlining that that flow through agreement okay that's so pretty much saying that i'll pay my go. bills okay. to them on time okay. <laughs> so Got it. the teacher is not a, a district is that correct? Correct. She's not on our specific payroll. But we have the opportunity to observe her to make sure that the curriculum is... is she is a certified teacher. She is a certified teacher. Four, I mean, four-year-old preschool has to have a certified teacher. Right. Uh, but since she is her own program, we are not a direct supervisor. Um, but she does have a supervisor. But she does have a supervisor under whoever supervises... Colleen. Oh, yeah. Do you have <coughs> liaison for who goes through the curriculum? Like, if we were to change our curriculum, like you just said, do we have some person that's in charge of making sure that they... That would that'd be in the role, of, uh, in my previous role as curriculum director, and now doing that as well. So that, that's how that communication occurs. So usually how these work, so we just sit at the beginning of the year, and I'll just go back to the Maharishis. We kind of sit down with them once a year. This is your money for the year. What do you plan on using it for? Okay, we get the agreement out there. So when they submit their expenses, we kind of already know what programs they plan on using their funding for. Um, so we try to keep it a good partnership that way. Of we just sit in here for a couple hours, talk it out, they write down notes, and they move forward. Again, this being staff, um, the, the biggest expense for their um, programming would be the teacher and a, you know um, additional adult. So they're required to meet the statewide voluntary preschool programming guidelines, but we cannot dictate how they meet those guidelines. And are they the only other preschool we have this arrangement with? Yes. Okay. And are they maxed out or around that twenty? Or? They have. They are not maxed out. Um, I want to say thirteen. That's an estimate. And they had to get certified under that program. Mm -hmm. so. One last clarifying question on page 185. It talks about transportation services. It says that they may be provided. Is that, re I mean, may I assume is not required, but if it were, it's their own to, for them to take care of? Or if they asked, would we have to provide bus transportation for them? Earlier it says we don't provide, and then later it says we may provide, so I assume okay. ultimately we're not offering transportation. We, you know, within our own um, 
preschool program a, a half day now we do transport um, students to and from child from potentially from community child care or to uh, little achievers you know if that's their second half of the day either in the morning or the afternoon um, and so I don't know if we're doing that um, the other way if we're already taking students there so I, I would have to follow up with mr. branch on that Any other discussion? All right. Move on to the vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries. All right. I think that's the last one, right? So move into our highlights. Uh, highlights are usually where we go around and talk about the highlight of the evening. Um, you guys just got sworn in, so not a lot of highlights probably, but... If you have one, go ahead, but it, I would also accept maybe a highlight of the convention uh, that you guys all went to. Um, just something that you uh, learned or something interesting. Uh, what was the most fun class you took or, you know, people you met or something. Um, we'll go around the table. So let me start with Dave. I, I found the, uh, the finance package very informative. I enjoyed that a lot. And I'm very anxious to get it with Evan to understand the uh, budget process and the forecasting process for the district and our current position and what we're forecast for in the future and what our challenges are financially for financial health. So that was a highlight and that just brings me back to wanting to start in on the the budget and the, the financial position of the, of the school district and uh, and the forecast for the future. Great. How about Deb? I loved getting to see what the vendors had that was new and interesting and um, groundbreaking and trailblazing, like mental health services and healthy <coughs> school lunch and breakfast programs and um, I found the collaboration extended to the exhibit hall as well and even you know some vendors were even saying oh and by the way this you know idea you had ties into the FIDA funding and it was just everyone was just so helpful and um, you know shared vision it was really clear so the whole convention was just we were just steeped in shared vision. It was nice. Mark Thornton. Besides drinking from the fire hose, uh, which was good just <laughs> to get different aspects of things you've never even thought of yet that you have to kind of wrap your head around. Um, I think for me, the big takeaway was just the camaraderie of just being there with this group. I don't really think everybody was there at some point throughout the <clears throat> couple days that we were there. So just getting to know people better and, you know, getting to know the new group and what we're gonna have to um, go through together. Um, and then also just meeting different people from different school boards, bringing people I didn't even know were school members in different communities, then it's like, oh yeah, okay. So yeah. Megan? Um, I think it was eye-opening too to see how many other dis districts are facing very similar issues. Um, and uh, I went to one session where it was called Shoot for the Moon Goal it was a small district, I forget the name, up in northwestern Iowa, and they, they had some real reading challenges post-COVID, but they got the entire community to come together behind this reading goal, and um, it was just marketed really well, and I feel like that's something I'd love to work with everyone towards is, is finding whatever it is that can really pull everyone together and, you know, get our kids reading or whatever, whatever that wildly important and shoot for the moon goal is because I think it'll go a long way to, to uniting everybody. Christy. So mine's a little bit of kind of what everybody said already, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it was just great. It was a great start to get to know everybody and kind of just, you know, figure out, you know, who everybody is and um, hear what other schools are doing and just see the different opportunities that I feel like are there. Um, I'm just really excited about, you know, the fresh start for our district and just, you know, kind of healing 
from, you know, the turmoil of the last few years and, you know, just starting fresh and heading in a positive direction, so. Mr. Vice President. Um, I've been sitting up here arguing for three hours, so I have plenty of highlights from the actual meeting, so <laughs> I don't need to touch on the actual school board meetings. But, uh, I think the first highlight was that any time the FFA is here, I just really enjoy that because I was an FFA member back in high school and I didn't take it far serious enough when I was there, but uh, I think as far as an organization or extracurricular activity for high schoolers, that's as good as it gets because it teaches so many life skills and practical skills for kids. And, um, I never went to the state convention, but I listened to a lot of people that I was in the chapter with talk about it, and it's just really fun to listen to those kids talk about the same experiences 20 years later. And um, there's that, but then, then also, um, you know, just having the last meeting with the old board and having the new meeting with the new board, you know, um, even among, you know, all the different debates and arguments that we've had with the old board, I actually missed them all, you know, and I had a lot of fun getting to know all of them the last couple of years, and it's, it's been a fun couple of years, and I, I think you guys will really enjoy it. It's, it's really rewarding work, and, uh. Um, I think we have a very bright future here. I think we have a really good board, and I think we have a really bright couple of years coming here. We just got to keep working together, so be good. Awesome. I also have a few. The uh, From the meeting before, I really enjoyed getting to talk about homeschool. I feel like we don't shine a light on our homeschool program enough. Um, you guys at the convention know I was talking about it over there, too, just as an avenue of getting better. Um, I love the fact that, you know, a light's been shined on it and maybe we can uh, use this to get, uh, you know, better for our homeschool kids. Uh, I also, you know, I'm going to miss the old board, like you said. Um, none of those people have the same uh, points of view as I do, and I appreciate every single one of them. Um, they, see, they see the world completely different than I did, and, uh, you know, I really learned from it. Um, and I'm very excited about the new board. You guys, a lot of fresh faces up here, eager to get working, which is going to be awesome. Um, and then from the convention, uh, I'm just very proud, again, that we won the uh, All Board Award um, for Education. Um, that's something, I don't know how often we do it. We've done it the last couple of years. Um, it's something I'd like to see continue. Um, and uh, yeah, all of us, we, there's a, always a lot to learn when you're up here. You're never gonna know it all. So getting all that education is awesome. And uh, welcome new board. And, I hope we have uh, great days and great discussions ahead. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Yes. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.